Chicago. Hi, I'm David Zucker, the assistant to the moderator. <laughs> I'd like to welcome all of you to the uh, to the first presentation of the new year at the Cosmic Complexes. All right, um, we have several policies. We have several policies here. First of all, one fool at a time. Two. Secondly, no personal attack. Uh, hold your head back so I can see that. All right, our program outline is as follows. First of all, there will be announcements made by <coughs> Charlie Paydock, our coordinator, will announce the upcoming program schedule. And anyone else who has any announcements of neighborhood or community interest um, will then be free to make announcements. Then our speaker will talk for about oh, an hour or so. We have a couple of them tonight. Actually, we have work. a couple of keynote speakers tonight. And in addition, it's going to be kind of an open mic tonight with um, comments from you about predictions in the new year. After that, usually we have questions and answers. Questions must be in that form. This is like Jeopardy, folks. And uh, no, no, no speeches. Save that for the rebuttals. And when Tim will portion out the time, and you can talk about anything that you want to for the amount of time that Tim gives you. And speaker or speakers will get the last word. All right. Uh, Charlie, why don't you start with the announcements? Okay. Welcome, everyone, to meeting number 3,698 of the College of Complexes. The playground for people who think. Trouble Just on a little bit of note, the very first meeting of the College of Complexes was on January 6th, January 6th, 1951. So I don't know how many years old we are now. I was at 72, 73 years old. Anyhow, happy birthday to the College of Complexes and everyone who's contributed over the years to keep us operational. Okay, uh, the, uh, first of all, as always, uh, we have a Google email group. Tim, you wanna bring up the, the, the screen? Yeah, I got it. And uh, you can see right there, uh, by the way, I came up, I designed a new logo for us there. But anyhow, there's instructions there on how to join the Google group. And we also have a meetup group, not much traffic. And I highly recommend that everyone subscribe to either one or both of those. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our six upcoming programs that have been scheduled. On January the 14th, um, I'm trying to get back in there, Charlie. It's just running slow in the browser. Okay. Okay, Charlie, we got it. Go ahead. Okay, on January 14th, as you can see there, uh, Jan Lee from our satellite campus will, giving us, will be giving us a fresh perspective on China. Yeah, I need a new one. But no, she just puts together good programs and I highly recommend uh, attending this. Transitioning to the 21st, uh, we did, actually have been contacted by several individuals to speak on this topic, but it's the privatization of Medicare issue, a serious issue. Anyhow, Jane Adams, Senior Caucus, will be returning to discuss that as well as healthcare issues uh, confronting millions of people in the United States. So they, they have a care over cost campaign. We'll learn about what that's all about. On uh, January 28th, with a topic yet to be determined, uh, the Libertarian Party will be returning uh, to give us a presentation on their current political perspective. So the 28th will be the Libertarians. Transitioning into February the 4th, 
President's Month, we're going to begin by celebrating and taking a look. Nancy Spanos, an author, spoken to the college before, will give us a special President's Day program on what everything you should know about Abraham Lincoln, what you should know about old Abe, the, 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 the rail splitter. Never, anyhow, okay, everything about Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> On uh, February the 11th, I'm coming to speak myself on the topic of capturing the outlaw. Was there a real Robin Hood? And I'm going to bring the talk up to date by, by um, I'll be taking a look at opposition to subjugation and servitude today in the manner of Robin Hood. And one thing we have to look at is why has there been century-wide worldwide appeal of this individual? Anyhow, Robin Hood, mark your calendars. Okay, that's on February the 11th. Um, on the 18th, and 24th, the dates are currently open um, at the college. So if you've got a topic in mind, please let me know. Now go into March, Tim. Um, in March, we're gonna be taking a look at social media. Um, and the speaker is gonna be talking about uh, Twitter and it's purchased by private uh, conservative elements. And the takeover of, of the whole issue, I uh, apparently of social media ownership and operation. We can't see anything, Tim, um, by the way. But, you know, wait. all right. So that's basically it. Take it away. Okay, Dave, introduce our speakers. Okay, and who's speaking besides John? John and uh, it'll be John and Joe Jennings. John's going first and then Joe Jennings. Okay. Go ahead. Our speakers tonight are John Bachtel and Joe Jennings. We're going to give us some what? Some prophecies on the new year? Prophecies, proph prophecies on the new year, yes. All right. So, John, I guess you're up first. Welcome. Give it up for John and Joe, guys. Ernie's on his way. Ernie's on his way. All right. Well, yeah, just I'm get here. the book. Yeah, Ernie's here now, so we'll get yeah. you here now. Okay. Good. And just, if you want to take that bottom cap off, that might help a little bit more. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that might go better. I'm sorry. It's just been very, very static -y. Go ahead and go ahead and you're uh, Thank you're you, set you're set Thank now. You and uh, good to see everybody. Can everybody hear you? Can you hear them? All right, go ahead, Joe. I mean, go ahead. Can you hear John. me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Use the mic louder. Green. Can you hear me? I think that's better. Okay. Yeah. Well, happy New Year, everybody, and it's really great to be back at the College of Complexes. Thanks for for the invitation to participate in this discussion tonight. Um, I understood I was going to talk a little bit about the 2022 elections and some of the aftermath. Uh, so I'm still a little blurry eyed from staying up last night watching the debacle uh, to elect Kevin McCarthy as House Speaker. And I'll return uh, to that in just a minute. But first, I want to give congratulations to the tens of thousands of grassroots activists who helped mobilize uh, the vote and participated in the midterm elections, all the voter mobilization, the door-to-door -door canvassing, leafleting, phone banking, texting, rallying, and poll observing paid off in a great, though not complete, victory. Consider what obstacles the pro-democracy movement faced, a tradition where the president's party suffers losses in the first midterms after a presidential election, Biden's high disapproval ratings, high inflation from monopoly corporate price gouging, 
and the lingering effects of economic crisis from the pandemic. The constant drumbeat of an inevitable red wave amplified by election experts and the mass media who ignored evidence to the contrary, like registration and early voting patterns and special election results. The GOP fooled the same pundits by flooding the zone with fake partisan polls showing Republicans leading or close in close or closely contesting in battleground races, and the strategy worked. The DNC directed from competitive battles that Democrats might have otherwise won. But voters alarmed over the assault on democracy weren't fooled. They fought tradition and the red wave never materialized. Democrats expanded their U.S. Senate majority by one and limited losses in the House. Tom Bonier said that this was the best performance by a president's party in midterm elections in history, which says a lot. And here are some additional observations. An anti-MAGA pro-democracy majority of Democrats, independents, and some Republicans exist in the country. The anti-MAGA majority has asserted itself now in the last three elections, 2018, 2020, and 2022, and a fourth election in 2016, if you count that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. Pro-democracy voters rejected MAGA extremism, scare tactics about out of control crime, migrants invading the open border, and QAnon conspiracies on fentanyl lace candy. Voters defeated election denier candidates in battleground states in defense of constitutional democracy, the rule of law, and the peaceful transfer of power, which I believe is the fundamental dividing line of our politics today. In reality, there were two elections that took place. One in the battleground states where pro-democracy organization, money, mobilization, and movement building resulted in setbacks for MAGA, and another election in red and blue states, which were largely uncontested. Voter mobilization in battleground states included $90 million invested at the grassroots turnout by the Democratic National Committee, and another 150 million by three major reproductive justice organizations. Campaigns targeted students and youth turnout was the second highest on record. Grassroots voter mobilization and alliance building resulted in victories in Georgia, Arizona, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Nevada, and Wisconsin, representing a model for future success. With an enlarged U.S. Senate majority, Democrats can approve Biden's judicial and cabinet nominees and, and chair committees without MAGA interference. Democrats won four trifectas and governorships in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, blocking future efforts to steal the presidency in critical battleground states. And in Wisconsin, Governor Tony Evers is the only line of defense against MAGA state legislature. Voters prevented the Republicans from gaining a super veto-proof majority. Abortion rights and defending democracy emerged as the biggest issue for Democrat, Independent, and some Republican voters. In fact, the election changed the day that the Supreme Court repealed Roe versus Wade. After that decision, the turnout of women voters, particularly young women and women of color, impacted every special election, the Kansas for abortion referendum, and the general election. Voters scored six pro-abortion victories, including in Kansas. Support for pro a pro-abortion amendment to the Michigan State Constitution powered victories up and down the ballot. Voters passed referendums for workers' rights here in Illinois, expanded Medicaid in South Dakota, 
legalized marijuana in five states, repealed slavery and criminal punishment in four states, and expanded voting rights in several states. But the narrow five vote Republican majority in the House of Representatives, and they won that, I think, by a combined 3,000 votes, guarantees political stalemate, instability, and political crisis for two years. The Republican caucus includes 21 members who won in districts carried by Biden, and they will be under enormous political pressure. Had it not been for extreme gerrymandering in Texas and Ohio, which used, which uh, uh, voted based on illegal, illegal maps that were rejected by the courts, Florida and the debacle in New York, Democrats would have won the House. Republicans may have reached the limits of extreme gerrymandering of congressional districts. Trump mega fascism dominates the House majority. Republicans differ on strategy as we witnessed with their inability to unite behind Kevin McCarthy as speaker. The Freedom Caucus faction that blocked McCarthy are ardent fascists, January 6th insurrectionists, seditionists, and QAnon conspiracists who straightjacketed McCarthy with compromises that will become clear soon enough. Ironically, the January 6th insurrectionists failed in an outside coup attempt two years ago on the same date, but captured the House from within last night. The January 6th insurrection lives on. Fractiousness, chaos, vicious infighting, and struggle for power between factions, instability, hostility to government, and constitutional limitations are all features of fascism and the GOP House Caucus. The GOP is now doubling down on the agenda voters rejected, abortion bans, voter suppression, cutting taxes for the rich, attacking LGBTQ rights, gutting Social Security and Medicare, and rolling back legislation passed uh, like the Inflation uh, Reduction Act and climate uh, legislation. They will obstruct and undermine the Biden administration and try to block just the Justice Department investigations into the uh, January 6th insurrection and into their own criminality. They will attempt to impeach Biden and cabinet officials after conducting show trial investigations. The GO people try to defund critical government programs like Medicare and Social Security by refusing to raise the debt limit, setting the stage for an economic and political crisis. The fascism, QAnon craziness, white Christian nationalism, and continuing assault on democracy by the GOP, the global alliance it has with authoritarian fascist governments and movements like in uh, like Putin and Orban are daily reminders of the ongoing threat that they pose to democracy. The GOP extreme right controlled Supreme Court will continue dismantling democratic rights from the bench. The repeal of Roe versus Wade was the first loss of a freedom ever in the history of the US. Denying the right to privacy puts other rights at risk. And if as expected, the Supreme Court rules in favor of the independent legislative doctrine in the Moore versus Harper case, what Trump and his fellow seditionists did in 2020 to steal the election will be legal. Despite an anti-MAGA majority, two political Americas exist. In nearly half the states, the GOP is creating what David Pepper in Ohio calls laboratories of autocracy, cementing permanent regime party rule and imposing extreme right-wing agendas using a combination of voter suppression, extreme gerrymandering, restriction or elimination of citizen initiated ballot measures, taking over state courts and invoking this, this 
independent legislative doctrine now before the Supreme Court. The MAGA, white power, and theocratic movement have a mass base of millions of people. It is flush with right wing and fascist billionaire dark money backed by the vast right wing propaganda media ecosystem beginning with Fox News. Because most Americans do not support them, MAGA turns increasingly to dismantling constitutional democracy, political violence, and threats against election workers, elected officials, teachers, and librarians. This hateful atmosphere encourages neo-Nazi attacks on the electric power grid across the country and mass shootings in schools, synagogues, African-American and Latino churches and communities, and LGBTQ clubs. Mass disinformation from foreign actors polluting the public space and information bubbles results in mass brainwashing and political polarization. The other Amer political America is states and cities where democratic forces in alliance with the Democratic Party have the upper hand, including blue states and many battleground states. This governing coalition is defending and expanding democratic rights, including abortion and women's rights, LGBTQ rights, racial equality, voting and workers' rights, taxing the rich, addressing the climate crisis, and transitioning to a green economy. We live in an era of a life and death struggle between democracy and fascism, authoritarianism, and autocracy. Pro-democratic, pro pro-equality forces must now redouble efforts to defend democracy and defeat entrenched MAGA power wherever it exists, including places like Florida and Texas. The battle to defend and expand constitutional democracy requires constant vigilance and engagement, mobilizing and uniting the pro-democratic majority, including in red states and red areas of blue states, like downstate Illinois, to oust MAGA from power. It's a daily battle in every political, electoral, ideas and information arena. We see what happens when voters sit on the sidelines and Democrats and mass democratic movements ignore them. Low voter turnout in 2010 led to the Republican takeover of many state legislatures and the imposition of extreme gerrymandering and voter suppression laws. We are still paying a heavy price. But 2020 and 2022 showed what happens when voters are engaged and mobilized. Mm. Bigger victories will require building movements and alliances across multiracial communities and making inroads into states and communities. MAGA now dominates, including white working class communities with that if they dominate through fear and appeals to racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, xenophobia, and Islamophobia. Both mobilizing Democratic-based voters and making inroads among white workers and others who are swayed by the MAGA movement are necessary to unite a decisive multiracial majority. No part of, our, of the working class and people can be abandoned or taken for granted. It means year-round organizing, contesting every state and community, urban and rural, every office, and building broad alliances. It means significant investment in youth voter turnout, historically high in the last three elections. Youth vote Democrat by two-thirds, making the GOP a dead party walking. Saving democracy and tackling humanity's enormous problems and crises will be impossible without breaking the right-wing obstruction and power in critical states, in government, and the judiciary. 
and the judiciary district. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. And so the struggle continues. All Thank right. You. you all set then? Yeah. All right. Hand me the mic. All right. Now. Or, no, we're, we're going to go. We're going to do a whole door three. Uh, three aspects first and uh as soon as i get the mic down here uh joe do you want to go next or do you want to no, go no yes ernie next okay ernie we're gonna get you next all right okay and we uh punishment for being late no 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 we're, we're gonna go right to it we can see you there and i'm gonna get you the mic yeah we can see you see you're right there yeah ernie ernie, ernie. ernie. okay ernie go ahead all right a little uh little uh, different format tonight. Uh, we don't get to stand up with a roster, which makes us feel like really fancy people were from our table. That's because that's, right? because that's kind of because that's that's kind of That's because the cup the the the, the, the oh. that podium's broken. Oh I gotta fix it. <laughs> they haven't right. done it yet. <laughs> this is not a high budget operation for anybody <laughs> who's new who might be listening. All right. Uh, my uh, topic is is gun violence and um, what we can do to prevent it. What's, uh, what some of the things are we can do to prevent it? First, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the types of gun violence and then uh, gun violence prevention solution. I think the most thing, I talked about this a few weeks ago. I'm going to try not to be too repetitive, but there were some key points I made that I want to make now and then go on to some new things and add some material. Um, what we have to realize when, when there's a mass killing, there's a huge there's use the mic. A huge, uh, there's a huge uh, hue and cry uh, about uh, you know preventing gun violence, uh, new gun laws, this, that, and the other thing, and all of that is fine. Except we have to realize there are several different types of gun violence. There are several different. Is it better? No, no, just, just use both of them. Oh, use both? Okay. Uh, and the, the reason for the gun violence is really a, is a very important issue. There are different solutions, different ways to prevent uh, different types of gun violence. Uh, you can't, you can't, it's not a one size fits all kind of thing. And uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, what I've reduced to uh, about four or five different uh, gun violence uh, issues and victims and uh, talk a little bit about what's behind them and uh, then the types of weapons that they use because that's also an issue. People are ranting and raving to get, get rid of the military weapons. Uh, as we will see, military weapons are responsible for a small fraction of the gun violence deaths in the United States. And uh, after we talk about that, then I'll talk about what I see as some of the things that we need to do, uh, including uh, which will make many people here happy. I think strict gun laws, I think we need those. Uh, but most uh, specifically, we have to develop solutions to uh, go with the specific types. Uh, of Ernie, gun I'm going to interrupt you on one thing. Well, yeah. I, I think it'd be a good idea to call cell phones to turn them off for silence. Yeah. Yeah, you're hearing a lot of noise in back here. I mean, you right. turn, turn. Okay. okay. All right. Um, types of gun crimes. Uh, the one that makes the news the most, but actually is responsible for a very small percentage of gun violence deaths in the United States are, are mass killings. Things such as the schools, Bali. Uh, and Sandy Hook, to name a couple, uh, the guy at the hotel in Las Vegas, uh, the grocery store situations, and, and I think there was a Walmart or a Costco a few years ago. Those kind of mass killings where somebody goes in and tries to kill as many people as they can, most of whom they probably do not know at all. Uh, and, and technically, a mass killing is, is defined as uh, any uh, gun crime where four or more people are shot. Uh, and that's fine. It may be appropriate in some cases uh, to, that it's a mass killing, but in some cases uh, it's not. I will, I will make a, a specific example here. This is week now. The Idaho uh, students that were killed, there were four of them. That's technically a mass killing. But that clearly 
does seem to have been a targeted crime and not a mass killing in the sense of something just wanting to go in and kill people who didn't kill. Presumably, uh, people were known to each other. So, so I don't think the number is the best way to define it. And the most statistics are based on the number. It's, it's very difficult for police to, to uh, attribute motives uh, to, to murder, but uh, in some cases, they're able to do it to an extent. So mass killings. Mass killings are typically uh, uh, characterized by people who have some kind of a grudge in society, or perhaps a company or a group of people, a large group a whole school, a whole company, or the post office, or whatever, uh, and they go in and kill, in, in a few cases, people that they know, but in many cases, people that they do not know. And and usually, quite frankly, uh, uh, not to get ethnic about this, but most of these are white people, and they're often middle class white people. They're not, it's not something that's uh, uh, based on poverty in most cases. Uh, in other cases, in school, in the case of school killings, uh, I think we do not uh, hear enough about uh, what, the, uh, what the motive of this victim was. Now, there are exceptions. We know that Timothy McVeigh, who, who uh, blew up the uh, Murrah building in, in uh, where was it, in Oklahoma City, I guess, and uh, uh, he, he was very clear what his motive was. He was really trying to fight that. And um, the fellow who shot up the supermarket in uh, Buffalo, there we had a, a, a manifesto, a white supremacist manifesto on the internet. So it's pretty clear what his motive was. But in many cases, it's not quite that clear. And I think in the case, particularly of school shootings, it, it probably has a lot to do with some form of bullying. And uh, it's, it's, it's hard to know. And I'm, of course, schools, the last thing they want is to have publicity out about how they were not controlling bullying, and then one of their students went out and shot a bunch of them at the school. So I think that, that what happens in those situations, uh, people try and vary it, and I don't know what to do about that except to speak out uh, for the information. Let me make some more specific comments on school killings uh, later. Uh, the second major category is crimes of retribution, is what I call it. These were usually the, uh, of, of gangs, where one gang member is killed and then somebody from another gang or their friends comes in and murders the person, murders their friend, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's one form. And then there are, there are other forms of crimes of retribution that are more individually based. But I think those are pretty small in number as compared to uh, gang killings. I think we have more gang killings here in Chicago than, than all of the mass killings in the country put together. I don't have the exact number on that. If somebody has that or can read it out, I certainly uh, be happy to hear it. Uh, so, but that's a whole different situation. The motives are very, very different than in mass killings, and therefore different, uh, different solutions involved. Uh, and if you left. Uh, then, and in most cases, we find often crimes of retribution and other types of crimes, uh, particularly crimes that are based on the romantic link that comes to breakup. The victims are known to the killers and vice versa. So, that it, it used to be that 70% of murder victims uh, were, were known to their, to their killer and vice versa. That may be going down a little bit. General killers are catching up, but nonetheless, still a large percentage of murders through guns uh, are committed by people who know each other. In the last category, uh, used to commit a crime. Obviously, if you're going to rob a store, you're, you might try and do it with a knife, but most frequently, you're going to do it with a gun. And and many people are killed in such situations. But again, the numbers from this, while well, there there's way too many. Uh, you know, are small compared to, to the crimes of retribution. Um, the last number I heard on mass killings, in other words, killings, uh, particularly where they're using a, a rifle as opposed to a handgun, uh, is something like 2% of gun deaths overall. Uh, the biggest number of people that are killed.
deal with guns in the United States year after year, the numbers change a little, but the biggest number on a consistent basis is suicide. A lot of people don't realize that. It's people killing themselves. And of course, there, there's, uh, you know, an issue uh, how do you prevent that. Um, I'm going to go on to the types of guns that are used because uh, uh, each of these groups is characterized by uh, typically by a certain type of weapon. Now, the mass killings are often uh, characterized by uh, rifles, uh, call, often called assault weapons. Uh, and uh, whereas all of the other groups, almost without exception, the kind of repetition uh, of uh, retribution, the romantic killing groups, the crime, et cetera, and suicide, those are all handguns. And so in terms of the weapons, the handguns are a big problem, uh, not, not the, uh, the weapons, the military style weapons, which aren't used. Uh, we should have some definitions here. Most people, you know, the, the press, particularly the people that are anti-gun, use the term assault weapon. And it's not clearly, I've heard different definitions of it, but it's not a handgun. It's either a semi-automatic or an automatic rifle. And automatic rifles, in other words, machine guns, oh, have been banned for uh, since the 1930s. And so, and they're very, very rarely oh, used to kind of, you know, the old, the old the, uh, uh, make sure uh, it gets back to the early and such, they were using machine guns, and maybe they did. But those were banned, and now very strictly uh, regulated and enforced. Now, the, the next category of what, what, uh, what is, uh, an automatic weapon is, is to pull the trigger and to keep through shooting bullets until such time as you release your finger. Uh, so you can shoot a, a, as many bullets as you want until you run out of ammunition. That's an automatic weapon. Those are used in military situations very commonly but uh, very seldom in uh, other situations. Semi-automatic weapons are rifles where you pull the trigger and it shoots a bullet. And it doesn't shoot more than one. You pull the trigger again, it shoots another one and another one. And uh, these, these are semi-automatic and often referred to as assault weapons because the typical soldier's weapon is one of these, a semi-automatic weapon. Most soldiers don't have automatic weapons even it's probably been more than a few years ago, but they usually have semi-automatic rifles. And uh, the AR-15, for example, is a semi-automatic rifle. Pull the trigger, shoot. Pull the trigger, again, and shoot. Uh, a whole volley at once. Now, the fellow that shot from the uh, hotel in Las Vegas, uh, when I heard the uh, news story on that, you know, heard the gun in the background there. Automatic weapon, that guy's got, got machine guns. But it was not. There's something that somebody invented, I think, fairly recently called a bump stock. And the bump stocks take a regular semi automatic weapon and convert it to an automatic weapon, which is also illegal. But I believe there anything you else we can do for Madam Dorothy? Uh, okay, now. Uh, so that kind no. of and then handgun. Yeah, maybe I'm the chauffeur and the butler, but you're the maid running around doing her clothes and like when she wants it. Enrique Perez and you, right? We're a little out of time. Who else is talking? Somebody up there? Okay. All right. All right. I'm willing to be the fool for the moment here. Okay. Um, okay. Now. How do we how do we prevent them by so we have to look at all these different cases differently okay mass killings uh typically are younger people and they are typically with uh, uh weapons which are sometimes called assault weapons or uh, ar-15 kind of thing not always sometimes uh, it's a handgun uh but the and it's usually very young people uh they're the they, uh Fellow Ivaldi, I think, was 18, and I think the fellow in Highland Park was maybe in his early 20s, but I'm not sure. They're very young. And so the notion of making it harder for young people to get these weapons, uh, having much more careful, uh, you know, criteria for, for people being allowed to have such a weapon uh, would be 
be very good. Stricter gun laws. I think I said earlier that we do need stricter gun laws. And the area where stricter gun laws would be very helpful would be to eliminate some of these mass killings because it would make it harder for people, particularly the young people, who seem to doing this, to get the weapons. And I would advocate for, for uh, uh, in addition to having to have a permit to have a gun, you have to have a license to drive a car, you have to have some uh, permit to uh, have a gun, and there would be some psychological examination that went along with it. Uh, and, and also, much, much older, I don't think uh, necessarily that we should allow people under 25, because you should the age of 21. Bring it to 25 and make exceptions for people who are honorably discharged from the military and know how to use these weapons, and for people who are in the police forces, for example, and other people who may uh, uh, who may have some need for this kind of thing. But uh, yeah, raise gun laws, be much, much, much more careful uh, checks. Um, I would also have, I would also suggest that, that all or most gun laws be national, not just the state, national apply to every jurisdiction and that there be a national gun res registration uh, system. The way we, we currently have a, local, a statewide registration system to be able to do with, um, do with a national system for guns. And guns are much cheaper. They're much more um, affordable than cars are. And uh, a new system, I'm not sure how that would work, they put serial numbers on some guns that are currently moving to get long. And now people can even build guns in their own home. Uh, so, you know, there would have to be some careful legislation on how that would be handled. But there should be strict penalties to owners, retailers, wholesalers, distributors, mail order stores, gun show providers, importers, and manufacturers of guns that are used in crimes or transferred illegally. Transfer to an inappropriate seat. And the, 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 the case of these people would be primarily, but not necessarily limited to financial uh, penalties. They should also be from jail sentences, too. And they should be enforced. I think this is one of the problems that, uh, that society in general, a lot of people disagree with me, but uh, uh, we, we do not punish any crimes. Uh, as strictly as strictly and as quickly as we could, we could be uh, it's more efficient and made them work faster and were stricter with the penalties and, and maybe have uh, some higher penalties, especially for multiple offenses. It, this is an area where it would help. Now, um, for the second category, crimes of retribution, most gang gangland slaves and other kinds of, uh, of retribution. In many cases, the people are not in legal possession of those guns in the first place, okay? Uh, so stricter gun laws uh, are not the issue, but, but uh, enforcement of those gun laws through a variety of methods uh, would be the issue here. Uh, one of the things which we had and gave up a few years ago because it was thought to be uh, discriminatory and is as uh, uh, stop and frisk. And well, maybe it is discriminatory, but, but in those areas where we have stop and frisk, we would, we would prevent some gun deaths. People would be uh, uh, very hesitant to, uh, uh, to have guns on them unless they were legal. Uh, and and uh, if they were legal, they would be traceable. And so, you know, that, that might help in that area. That is a difficult area because it's a crime of uh, retribution. There is some level of emotion. Emotion rather than logic proves the roost in those cases. Very difficult to deal with and, and uh, very strict uh, tracing of guns would help. So you, if you know who guns belong to, then you can trace them. Find guns that aren't uh, heavy penalties just for having them. Okay. Uh, and as far as cases for victims or known to killers, it may or may not be uh, legal in their possession, 
but in some cases, people have guns legally, and and we do this to kill someone. And there are, of course, accidental kids, killings where people have guns absolutely uh, legal. In fact, uh, it's very common. Unfortunately, it's common with uh, children finding guns. And, you know, that seldom ends well. Um, if, and if guns are used to commit a crime, well, the person who's going to commit a crime, first of all, isn't going to care what the gun laws are. They need a, they, you know, they, need, they feel the need to commit a crime. They're willing to take the risk of doing so. They're certainly going to be willing to take the risk, the risk of having an illegal gun. So uh, there is a case where uh, gun, the gun system is only good if you can get all guns registered in some fashion or another. Suicides, uh, I, I don't know the statistics on this, but certainly if somebody wants to commit suicide and do it with a gun, uh, they can probably get a gun. They might even be able to get it legal. So that's a different problem as well. Uh, what it gets to in, in, in the first case, mass killings, uh, often, uh, what's that? A little louder. A little louder? All right. I'll, I'll go a little louder here. Sorry. I hope I didn't put anybody in the place. Um, the, the, the issue here is, is uh, with mass killings, okay, you can restrict the gun. The others, we can, we can trace the guns, that, that will help. But the solution to most of the a major aspect of the solution is mental health. Uh, having mental health care, having mental health monitoring, one sort or another. Uh, I'm not going to go into that in any detail because I don't know a lot about it. But that's where the solution lies. It does not, it does not lie in in uh, stopping to sell certain types of guns to people who are responsible gun owners. Uh, of course, our laws should be very careful. In the Recording in progress. Okay. 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 Where are we at? All right. Uh, now, that, that covers the issue of whether guns are are legally possessed or not. And I think in most, in a lot of these cases, they are not. So it's not a lot of cases, they are not. Issue is not a lot of Stop and frisk, I mentioned. Stop and frisk, yes. Stop and frisk, yes. People don't like it because of the civil rights aspects to it. But the people whose dignity is being protected by banning, uh, uh, are going to use lose more of their young men than they otherwise would. So it's a trade off, and yeah, I'm very much in favor of stop and frisk. Um, okay, uh, one of the things which isn't talked about with possession of guns and why guns should be legal is the is the fact that the threat or even the possibility of the presence of a gun will deter criminals. Uh, in other words, if there are some criminals that think they're going to, uh, they're going to go in and rob a store or, or grab some people or whatever, uh, if they know or suspect that the people they're going to uh, victimize have a gun, uh, they're less likely to do it. And I, I've heard figures, I don't know where these figures come from, but they actually sound reasonable. It up to over 3 million gun crimes a year are prevented simply because the potential perpetrators uh, were concerned that there might be a gun uh, in present. And some evidence for this is in England, where they don't have guns. And if we had more time, we'd talk about that a little bit. They don't have guns. So they have about two or three times as many hot burglaries in England that we have here in the United States. What a hot burglary is, is when a burglar goes in, uh, knowing or, or not knowing, but not being concerned about whether the occupant is there. They're just going in to grab some stuff, but if the people's there, that's, that's too bad. In the United States, most burglars don't do that because they know that there is at least a possibility of those people have a gun. And if they go in, that the gun may be used on them. And it's perfectly legal in most cases. 
done on that. So uh, that you know that gives some indication that the guns do or the possible presence of the gun does deter crime. Um, I want to say just a couple things before we end here. Uh, the Second Amendment. Okay, I, I do advocate gun rights. I advocate very strongly much stricter gun law, but I, I uh, also advocate gun rights for response to the people, but not because of the Second Amendment. To me, the Second Amendment is an anachronism. It was something that was created by these guys who may have had a little bit too much, uh, whatever it is they drank, both the uh, mead or whatever. Whatever they drank back in those days. And then if you read the Second Amendment, it, it, it barely makes any sense at all. The language is ambiguous and disjoint, and it can be read either way, and the Supreme Court has read it either way on, on different situations. And uh, why were the uh, founding fathers concerned? In my opinion, and it was relevant back then, uh, founding fathers were concerned because they had just come out of a despotic dictatorship. Uh, King George III, and they wanted to be sure they had the possibility of protecting themselves from the government. And they thought if everybody has a gun, and if a large people number uh, people have guns, this is one way to do it. Now, that is irrelevant to this because if there's a despotic government that is going to uh, try and take over society, they're not likely to use guns, they will use technology. And they'll use they'll use uh, uh, the internet yeah. or, or not let people use the internet or whatever. This is how it will work today. So this business about people having guns is, is relatively less uh, important than it was. And so, uh, also the reason that I believe that these people have right to have guns is something I call natural law, uh, regardless of whether it's in the Constitution or any. any uh, laws or ordinances, we have a, a natural law to protect ourselves and protect our loved ones. And this this supersedes any law. If there's a law which says it is illegal for me to have a gun, but somebody is breaking into my house, it's going to uh, do harm to my family. I don't care. Okay. I will use that gun and uh, to protect my family, and most people will, or to protect my business. And I will deal with the consequences uh, at a later time. Um, that basically covers my primary remarks. So maybe we'll go into Q and A, uh, and later on, and talk if somebody will have some comments or questions. I'm sure people do. All right. We're gonna. Can you? Can everybody hear me now? Pretty well. Okay. Uh, and uh, okay, let me get me back on the mic here in a minute. On the, on the camera here. All right, uh, Joe. I, sorry about that. Okay, Joe, are you ready to go? Unmute, Joe. We had muted you during the meeting. So okay. Um, All right, we'll mute. Now, now what I, should I hit the share screen thing on the bottom again? Well, uh, you hit the share screen thing on the bottom, and we'll uh, let you go. We'll mute here at Dappers, and uh, let's go well, ahead. Okay. Share screens at the bottom. I see it, but uh, see I got to find my uh, slideshow there. Okay. You got it? Uh, well, not share. Then you should be, if, if, if the slideshow is open, there should be a screen with it up there or something, unless you have it open. I'm not open. Well, I, you know, we had it before, as you know, so let's right. keep working at it here, sir. Okay, you should be you should be able to see it with not much trouble. Uh, let's see. I can't I can't share your screen from here. Um, um I can unshare it but not share it. But that's not what I want. You got it now, Joel. No, that's right, not yeah, it. I'm sorry. That is not what we want here. <laughs> All right. Well, okay, guys, we're gonna work in we're gonna get through this thing together here. Okay, there's okay. Uh, let's see. I've got my slide thing up here. But I don't right, see it. Share screen, hit the share screen on the bottom of the Zoom. We'll it's, not, it it's not there. We had it, but we don't have it right now. <sighs> okay. You see the share screen button at the bottom? Not on the bottom. I don't. I, I've got my slideshow up. Okay. Uh, 
put your window and like, like a like a like not like a full screen, but just get it to a partial screen. Okay. Okay. Now hit your share screen button on Zoom. Okay. Now do you see it? We see Joe Jennings. Is, yeah, we can see it now. Do you see me now, the, on, on your John screen. F. Kennedy there? Yeah. Now what you want to do is in that window, there should be right at the uh, right below the. Uh, where, where the, the JFK files now, and it says, uh, uh, I think it says, uh, full, uh, slideshow. Show, uh, slideshow. Slideshow. Okay. Hit that. Hit that. No, no, no. It's, it's okay. Uh, yeah, that's it. You got it. Just go ahead and start talking now. Okay, guys. Well, listen, um, I heard a few attacks on Texas from the earlier speaker there. We ain't all bad down here. <laughs> Oops, uh, I'm sorry, I muted you, Joe, by mistake. <laughs> there, do you hear sorry, me now, uh, gentlemen? No, I'm sorry, my apologies, I wanted to mute us. Okay, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, So, Okay, listen, um, yes, I am uh, speaking to you from Houston, Texas. Um, I am Joe Jennings. Um, I'm very active politically, and I, uh, I think that's pretty amazing that you guys at the College of Complexes have been um, at this continuously since before I was born, if, I, if that was right, uh, what he said in terms of the numbers. Um, and we are going into a new year, uh, and this is a very uncertain moment in history. Um, that in many respects. And um, I am active and have been active for decades with um, Lyndon LaRouche, who's no longer with us, who passed on in 2019 at age 96. His widow, Helga, is carrying things forward. She was the founder of something called the Schiller Institute in 1984 as an international philosophical um, uh, organization in, inspired by Friedrich Schiller. Do people there know who Friedrich Schiller is? Great poet and playwright of Germany in the uh, early 19th century. He inspired Beethoven to wrote his beautiful Ninth Symphony. Alle Menschen werden Brüder, from that phrase from O to Joy means all men shall be brothers. So he was committed to a brotherhood of man and woman, obviously um, brought together by creative ideas. Now, this year also happens to be the 60-year um, anniversary of a, of, a tra of, a, of a crime that was committed against our nation um, in November of this uh, 22nd of this coming year, which was the murder assassination of our president, uh, John F. Kennedy. And uh, I'm going to put forward tonight that we are committed to finally bringing um, the truth of that incident out into the open as a way to shift the, the balance of cowardice, of fear, of lies, which is taking the world right now to thermonuclear war. And I'll develop that. Now, I also want to say um, uh, Merry Christmas to everybody and Happy New Year, because uh, today is actually Christmas Day for the people that uh, celebrate um, in, of the Orthodox faith. Greek, Romanian, Ukrainian, and Russia. This is Christmas Day. And um, yesterday was called Epiphany, which is a Christian concept for seeing the light, having a higher inspiration. And I think, and, in, and in the, the legend is that's when the wise men came to Bethlehem. And we definitely need a, a lot of wise men to make it through this period here. So this image here is from the official uh, portrait of John F. Kennedy that was commissioned by his widow, uh, Jackie, after her husband was assassinated, you know, a reflective kind of portrait, unlike any of the other presidential portraits you see. Um, now, on this question of the holidays, what um, my movement has been doing is that a call did go out um, from uh, both Pope uh, Francis of the Catholic faith and um, Patriarch Kirill, of, of the Orthodox um, for a truce, uh, a succession of fighting in Ukraine during this brief uh, holiday period as a, a way of, of calming things down so people could be with family and um, 
And uh, this has a precedent uh, in um, something that actually happened in 1914, you know, a horrific, a horrific, senseless war, you know, uh, World War I, gripping Europe, um, uh, carnage of in, in, incredible barbarity, um, mustard gas and trench warfare. But on Christmas night in 1914, uh, the uh, Doughboys, the um, the Germans, the French, the English, together laid down their arms and 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 celebrated together with music, playing soccer. This is commemorated in a movie I, I would recommend if you haven't seen it. It's called Joyeux Noël of this incident. So this idea of the Christmas truce is uh, um, is something that we had um, we had advocated, you know, and and in fact. There's talk that maybe the Vatican could be opened up as a neutral meeting place to negotiate an end to this thing, because you've got, um, if you have intractable forces on both sides, you know, and no uh, conversation or discussion toward a way out, we are heading toward thermonuclear war. Uh, and what you see here is a, um, a vigil that uh, my friends, uh, I took the picture, so I'm not in the picture. But this was in Houston, Texas. You might recognize your old friend Ron Batag on, on the right side. Um, that's my wife, Betty, um, um, Ron's wife, Diane, and Joel. I, I, I ran the independent candid candidacy of Joel DeJean for US Congress um, here in Texas in the last round of uh, uh, elections in the 38th district. And yes, he did run as an independent. Okay, now since we've got a brief briefer program tonight, those of you who did not hear my earlier classes, and I've given a number of them for the College of Complexes, both in Dallas and in Chicago, they're all archived. I really recommend you go back to them. Okay, you know, I, the, the, the history of this war, I had one called Abolish NATO. I had one on the hit list, the targeting of, of, uh, of um, you know, uh, many voices of opposition to, to, um, that, that don't accept the NATO Western narrative about the war being targeted. It's all there. It's all very well documented. You know, there's a there's just an awful, awful history in Ukraine of how Western billionaires, corporate interests, hedge funds, um, national endowment for democracy financed the violent overthrow of the uh, legitimately elected Ukrainian government in 2014 and brought to power an illegitimate government with remnants of the old Nazi um, um, networks that had persisted uh, and been kept on stipend through the US State Department over decades and decades, nurturing anti-Russian hatred and at, the, at that moment to bring Ukraine into the uh, orbit of NATO uh, to launch operations against Russia. This despite the fact that two referenda, the people in Ukraine voted for neutrality those those uh, those were just thrown aside by NATO's uh, agenda. Um, so, but the question is, what are we going to do about it? Well, one thing we've been doing, as you see, we've been holding these vigils. Uh, we've been holding um, online conference events. On you know, this one was called. I think it was in June. One hundred seconds to midnight on the doomsday clock. You know, uh, with participation from all around the world. The ambassador from Russia to the U.S. spoke at one of these. Now, a question, is this enough? Obviously, it's not. There's other stuff that's called for to bring an end to this carnage. But obviously, somebody thinks we're kind of significant because this just showed up yesterday in the Wall Street Journal opinion column. Um, American Putin's American cheerleaders, how Jeffrey Sachs, Mark Episcopos, and Dmitry Symes contribute to the Russia propaganda effort, okay? So uh, what are they saying? This is, in, this is the main opinion piece. American commentators and journalists often appear on Ukrainian television expressing solidarity and offering analysis. Russia's airwaves have largely been free of US voices, save for occasional clips from American air airwaves by Ukraine critics such as Tulsi Gabbard, Tucker Carlson, and Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. Most U.S. Get guests on Russian media come from the fringe, including former Virginia State Senator Richard Black, who associates with the Lyndon LaRouche movement's Schiller Institute, and Scott Ritter, 
an embittered and disgraced former American intelligence officer turned critic of the war in Iraq. So that was in yesterday's Wall Street journals. You can look it up yourself. Here we are right there. What are we doing? Our movement, the Schiller Institute, that these um, that the hedge funds and the powers that be behind the Wall Street Journal are so afraid of. Well, maybe we'll touch on that. Um, we are, I, I will appoint you ahead, going to have an event on January the 10th, which you can access yourself on schillerinstitute.com. I think Charles Padick has actually posted the link to this um, on um, which you can access on the CFC website. So central time, that'll start at 10 a.m. And it's called, What About International Law, Mrs. Merkel? And the speakers that you'll see there, um, second from the left is Scott Ritter, who was just mentioned in that Wall Street Journal diatribe against my movement. Helga LaRouche, um, who's number one on the hit list of the uh, Ukrainian Center for Countering Disinformation, uh, will be speaking. And there's others. You can see the roster of speakers down below. But what about the title? What about international law, Mrs. Merkel? Now, that would be Angela Merkel. Well, what are we referring to? Leading up to, and of course, you've heard all the narrative, unprovoked war, unprovoked war. Putin just walked into Ukraine one day to restore the Soviet empire. And if you challenge that narrative, you are a Putin sympathizer. Now, leading up to this thing, you know, after the overthrow of the Ukrainian government in 2014, you know, and you had violent, you know, ethnic racist shelling by the neo-Nazis against the Russian-speaking minorities to the east, you know, there was an, um, a purported attempt to cool the thing out. And this was something called the Minsk Accords, negotiated in Minsk, which I believe is in Belarus. The parties signing on to, you see here, Vladimir Putin, Angela Merkel, Francois Hollande and uh, President Poroshenko of Ukraine. And, the, and the, the, the substance of it was to try to cool things down, let the Russians um, in the East retain their own language, uh, stop the shelling, uh, and a, a certain amount of sovereignty to the provinces in, in the East, Donetsk and Lugansk, Luhansk, right? And throughout those years, the shelling persisted. 14,000 people were killed in the East. You didn't hear about that too much, did you? Uh, and the argument was, well, Putin's not doing enough. Putin's not doing enough to enforce the Minsk Accords. We're gonna slap on some more sanctions. We're gonna sanction the ruble. We're gonna cut off pharmaceutical shipments. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. Well, son of a gun, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Angela Merkel gives an interview to say, uh, to Der Spiegel and Die Zeit saying, well, we really didn't mean it. You know, we kept our fingers crossed. You know, we used those seven years to arm uh, the Ukrainians and to, um, you know, and to train their troops to be able to confront Russia. So the whole darn Minsk Accords, Minsk one and two was a lie, was a lie. Now this is these are, are uh, these were accords that were signed and notarized with the force of international law, you know, and the parties on the accord from the West, including Francois Hollande and Poroshenko, said it was all a lie to give the Ukrainians uh, time to arm and and train to go to war against Russia. And the question coming from Russia: Can we trust anybody in the West at all? I'm reminded of a, of a similar lie from a lady named Nancy Pelosi on this question of uh, the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq that purportedly were the justification for Operation uh, um, Iraqi Freedom. You know, and she was on the Intelligence Committee and here's what she said after the fact. We have now come to learn quite clearly that that was wrong that there were no weapons of mass destruction, no chemical or biological weapons in any significant amount held by Iraq, by Saddam Hussein, or by anyone else. Many of us knew that. Many of us knew that 15 months ago when the Congress voted on this war. Did she stand up on her desk and protest? No, she did not. You know, and Scott Ritter, who was derided by the Wall Street Journal in his attack on my movement, was the individual, you know, official weapons inspector 
that went into Iraq and said there are no weapons of mass destruction. There's nothing to this. And my wife uh, gave me for Christmas a, a book by uh, Scott Ritter, you know, it, uh, going through his um, his uh, experience as a weapons inspector, you know, in Russia during the age of perestroika that resulted in the wonderful INF treaty being negotiated and signed by Gorbachev and Reagan. But those days of trust are past. You know, there's something now called the rules-based order, not international law, the rules-based order, which you just make up the rules as you go along to justify a policy of permanent war with the ultimate end of crushing Russia and crushing China. And this is not hyperbole. This is very, this is, this is widely discussed. So uh, I guess some of you saw this, uh, this uh, little show, uh, the Thursday before Christmas, where um, Volodymyr Zelensky comes and uh, addresses the U.S. Uh, Congress, standing ovation, all the Democrats, almost all the Republicans, uh, and, uh, you know, and here he is presenting the Speaker of the House with the flag. And I'm going to um, tell you, and, you know, we just had a presentation on guns. Let's, let me just read to you the shopping list of what was just shelled out in this arms package to Ukraine, the last one of the year, uh, $3 billion worth, right? The package includes 50 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles with 500 tow anti-tank uh, missiles, 250,000 rounds of 25 millimeter ammunition, 100 M113 armored personnel carriers, five mine resistant ambush protected vehicles, 138 high mobility multi-purpose wheeled vehicles, and an additional 18 155 millimeter self-propelled howitzers, along with a variety of other weapons, munitions, and other vehicles and equipment. The package also includes 225 million to, in foreign military financing to contribute to the long-term capacity uh, and modernization of Ukraine's military. And then Secretary of State Anthony Blinken announced another 682 million in, uh, in military fan financing for European countries to, to, to get their weapons rolling into Ukraine. Okay, and I wanna tell you at the end of the year um, budget uh, 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 item that went through also included $12 billion cut in Medicare, okay? So you can talk about Republicans and bad Democrats, good. This is across the board, guns, no butter. You know, we're gonna go to war to crush and subdue Russia um, and uh, we're gonna, and every, everything else be damned. Now that agenda has to change. And the question, and so, so where's this coming from? Quick, a couple of items real quickly. This was from October. Foreign Affairs Magazine, which is the uh, um, house organ of an outfit called the Council on Foreign Relations, which has been the American branch of the Royal Institute of International Affairs since its founding around World War I, which is, of course, when America first allied with the British for the first time in our history. Could America win a new world war? What it would take to defeat both Russia, to de defeat both China and Russia? OK, here we have a guy named Dr. Nigel Gould uh, uh, Davies um, of some British pedigree, I think, with Cambridge. I beg your pardon. Thank you. Um, Putin ha Hello? Putin has uh, Charles, Hello? Charles, please mute. OK. Um, Putin has no red line saying, you know, you should ignore all of Putin's warnings about the consequences of where this is leading with these offensive weapons. Just ignore them. He's bluffing, right? Putin has no red lines. Here you have former NATO General Breedlove, you know, um, saying we need to have weapons to strike deep into Russia. That's what he's saying. And of course, this has already begun to happen. You've seen the drones and so forth striking on um, uh, facilities within Russian territory. Um, wow. Uh, and yet we, we have this idea that, you know, if we just send enough uh, arms to these Ukrainians who are, who's, you know, who's being, their, their, their men, their boys are being taken down, right? These are, this is a nation that voted for neutrality twice, as I said that was swept up into a NATO scheme 
to you know to crush and subdue uh, Russia and assert global dominance. Okay, um, and then of course John Bolton, who I I just um, here is going to de declare himself for president as a um, a Republican. Of course, he was the one that was booted out by Trump for even being too right wing. You know, um, there was an attempt to try to calm down things on the Korean Peninsula and, um, you know, and, and uh, maybe a negotiated disarmament of, of, of North and South Korea. But Bolton was the one that said, oh, no, no, we're going to use the Gaddafi uh, treatment for Kim Il-sung. And of course, that, that scotched the whole treaty. And here he is, um, um, uh, you know, decrying um, the fact that Turkey and Hungary and a few of the NATO nations aren't fully on board but then he's saying, but yeah, but we have to expand NATO. You know, we need to bring in Israel. We need to bring in Singapore. We need to bring in, I, we applaud what um, Japan is doing to beginning to rearm, right? So, you know, anyone that thought that LaRouche was a crackpot and we're talking about NATO's global uh, reach, well, it's right there, sir. Um, so um, so what, what about Japan now? Now you should know, and I, I bet you don't know because it was barely covered in the West, but in Taiwan, the population of Taiwan had popular elections uh, about six weeks ago, and they emphatically repudiated the Independence Party. You know, that these were local elections and regional elections, but the party of, of the regional director who calls herself president, but, but Taiwan is not a country, it's part of, of, of China, according to international law, you know, but that party was repudiated the, the people said we don't want to be part of some nato you know pacific scheme to pit us against mainland china okay kamala harris uh, about a month ago went over to philippines and say we will give you oh we know all these problems with china and the south china sea well we will help you we will give you as many arms as you want to go to uh you know to defend yourself you know and, and we'll station missiles on your territory we'll we'll back you up 100 percent with all the weapons you want well you know what just happened marcos just had a meeting with xi jinping and they signed a 23 billion dollar trade and development pact involving philippine um, uh, um agricultural goods going to china in exchange for rail and uh, other uh, vital infrastructure you know, is there something wrong with your, your sense of U.S. policy? But then here you have uh, President Biden, and he will be meeting again this week with Kishida, um, the, the new uh, incoming, um, well, the new, the current prime minister of Japan. And now um, China, uh, Japan is being courted to um, get rid of the, um, the, commitment to pacifism that was written into the constitution of Japan, you know, at the end of World War II. You know, uh, I, I mean, um, someday I'd like to give you a class on what, you know, on the role of the British and encouraging the imperial faction in Japan and what they did in slaughtering 30 million Chinese, but I'll leave that for another time. But at the end of World War II, there was a beautiful constitution which dedicated Japan to being at peace with its neighbors. You know, this was a, a, a wonderful document that MacArthur, who had opposed the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that were done under Harry Truman, nonetheless crafted this. But now the US, the Pentagon, you know, the State Department are saying, no, forget all that. You're going to be part of global NATO. So this is really uh, really dangerous stuff here. And the question is, are we dancing into World War III? You know, and uh, just so you know, that is uh, Zelensky in the middle. That's also Zelensky over there on the uh, far left, you know, before he uh, was uh, elevated to become president of Ukraine. He was a comic actor, sometimes, you know, comic uh, erotic dancer. And I will spare you the video of him playing chopsticks with his penis you know, um, which was a, a, a great little comic skit he used to do. You can find it on YouTube. It's there. Now, this is the guy that we just gave all those howitzers to. You know, this is the superstar. Come on. Now, I'm going to point out one picture from that there. You know, this is, a, this is not my congresswoman. She's the next district up for me. My congressperson is Al Green. And, I, you know, I, I try to correspond with him however I can, as we should all do. 
But the woman uh, embracing um, uh, Zelensky there as he's reaching his way to the podium is Sheila Jackson Lee, who pro you know proudly considers herself part of the Progressive Caucus. You know, well, that's very interesting. What short, you know, and of course, when I was an executive member of the Harris County Democratic Party, which I was for 15 years, um, you know, I would kind of march with this lady and protest against Cheney Bush and the wars being perpetrated by the Republicans, you know, in, uh, the Bush administration. But, um, you know, a, a, a lot of the people that opposed the wars under Cheney Bush came to embrace them under, uh, under uh, you know Obama Biden, it's funny how um, you know amnesia works. And but just look right here. This is a letter. You can see Sheila Jackson Lee's uh, signature, third from the left on the top. This was issued to Mike Pompeo in 2019. I don't have the body of the letter. You can find it in one of my previous classes. But this was the Progressive Caucus protesting to Pompeo. Why are we arming? a bunch of white supremacist, anti-Semitic neo-Nazis in Ukraine. And specific, and why are they not put on the terrorist list along with um, you know, Al-Qaeda and, and uh, Hezbollah and the others, right? And, and, and the letter specifically cites the Azov Battalion as being at the center of the uh, Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, Muslim, you know, mass killing of Muslims, the deployment of this uh, Nazi international, I will tell you that the guy that did the shooting at the top supermarket in Buffalo, whose name was um, 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 Peyton Gidon, uh, or Gendon, was a, if you looked at his website, yes, it was a, a white supremacist diatribe, but at the core of it was his admiration for the Azov battalions. It had the famous Azov battalion, Black Sun, right there. So, you know, in the death cult of, um, um, you know, that, that the, the anti, the, the death culture that's being perpetrated where these uh, neo-Nazis are being uh, uplifted as heroes, you know, um, um, this is what you, this is what you, this is what, this is the ugly child of, of America having this militarist uh, foreign uh, policy, okay? And um, I will tell you, a lot of those weapons for those, my, my former speaker who was concerned about the guns, about 70% of those weapons going over to Ukraine are being, um, you know, resold into the dark market. For example, um, the um, president of Nigeria, whose name is Mohamedou Buhari, um, um, spoke up at the United Nations and said, look, you know, we're trying to develop our country, but this terrorist group Boko Haram is tearing things up in the hinterlands, you know, and most of the weapons they're getting are from our American weapons transited through Ukraine. So you got to think about this stuff, guys, you know, you, you, you remember, you know, that under the Carter period, and there was a movie about it that glamorized it with Tom Hanks and Julia Roberts called Charlie Wilson's War, but the U.S. started arming Al-Qaeda in um or it was called uh, it was called something different back then it was but it, it was arming um an army under uh, uh Zbigniew Brzezinski's direction in Afghanistan you know to supposedly confront Russia there well what goes around comes around so this has got to stop and so we're going to come back to this question of John F Kennedy because you know we have a whole foreign policy based on lies you know people are buying these lies you know uh, people that are challenging these lies like myself, like my friends, you know, uh, are being put on target lists, you know, with an, um, to be silenced and eliminated, gross sense, wartime censorship. But so we, we, we have to crack the power of these intelligence services, which are integrated with the media, you know, um, um, you know with, uh, with, uh, with, with private finance, how do we do it? And we have to go back to the big lie that defined this period, um, going back to a, 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 a singular incident that happened on November 22nd, 1963 in Dallas, the murder of this president and, and why. Um, my friend Dennis Speed, um, um, 
gives a Shakespearean aspect to this is, is like the ghost of Hamlet and Shakespeare. You know, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. There's been an unjust and foul murder. The kingdom is falling apart through dissolution. It ends up being just conquered at the end. Um, and somehow or other, the ghost of John F. Kennedy um, beckons us all to um, let the truth come out and, and, and bring back the higher mission that our nation had back then. Um, now, this came out recently because there was actually a congressional mandate that um, uh, um, that all where the entire Congress mandated uh, to have all the documents released. And I think the expiration date was in 2018, which was uh, during, of course, the Donald Trump presidency. And Trump made a bombastic announcement one morning saying, yes, we're going to release all those documents, right? Uh, well, um, then in the afternoon, he had a second press conference that said, well, uh, actually, we're not going to release them. We're going to revisit this in six months. Well, six months came and went. Now, who convinced, who, um, you know, whatever, put the screws on Donald Trump not to release those documents? Well, Tucker Carlson asked this question at the point that uh, the matter came before President Biden. Biden did release some documents, but over 4,000 of them are still under lock and key. And uh, Carlson intimated that he had talked to a, a source who had access to them. Uh, we don't know who that source is, but one indicator is that um, Tucker Carlson invited uh, Mike Pompeo, former head of the CIA onto the show to comment on this. And even though uh, Pompeo rarely passes up a chance to get on Fox News, for some reason, Pompeo did not wanna comment on this question. Right. So who are they protecting? Because everyone that was remotely involved in the murder of President Kennedy, which happened 60 years ago, is dead. You know, I was seven years old when Kennedy was shot. I'm now 67. So so how is it? What, what are they protecting? They're not protecting people. They're in, they're protecting institutions and ongoing policy, you know, uh, where covert activities as opposed to honest relations define our relations with the world. Now, I'm going to mention what my movement did um, on the 50th anniversary of Kennedy's death. Uh, and, I, I, and Charles, uh, link to the end of the, uh, this presentation. You should all watch this tomorrow. We, my movement, the Schiller Institute, which also believes in a cultural renaissance, um, uh, uh, put together a concert in um, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, in uh, the Holy uh, Church Cathedral, or uh, I think it was the Holy Shrine, same church in Boston where um, Jackie Kennedy had organized a, a, a similar concert 50 years ago to the day. And the piece we performed, and I wasn't there because of job conflicts, even though I love singing, uh, but I, I couldn't be there. This was Mozart's Requiem, beautiful, beautiful piece of music. Um, um, that Mozart composed in his dying days. He, like John F. Kennedy, died very young. And addressing uh, in, in uh, remarks before um, the concert began were remarks from the president of the Republic of Ireland, <laughs> the former mayor of Boston and ambassador to the Vatican, Ray Flynn, and, and Helga LaRouche, okay? So, um, and, and, and there's a pause in this beautiful mass there's a mass for the dead. That's what Requiem means. There's a pause, whereas a mass you would normally maybe give communion or pass the collection plate. But what we did in this one was that we played some audio images from um, Kennedy's um, um, life. So here's a picture of the original concert in uh, January 19th, 1964, You know, right after the murder of our president, Lyndon Johnson, you know, had taken the presidency. We were already going into Vietnam, which is uh, what Kennedy was beginning to pull out of when he was killed. Um, um, there's Jackie Kennedy, um, the Cardinal Cushing there, the extended Kennedy family, Teddy, and so forth. So, um, so as I said, um, we intersperse this beautiful music with uh, some images of the scientifically optimistic America that wanted to do good in the world. Um, 
And you, you get this very thoughtful response from the audience there, dead silence. It was a packed church, um, you know, just reflecting on what we lost, what happened to our nation, you know, and, and, and I want everyone here to think about that as well, because we don't think about the, 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 the world the same way we did back then. Even I, who was in second grade, you know, I, I noticed a shift that was strange, you know, but but we began to kind of lose our soul, I think, during the 1960s. Um, now, the, the book that I um, we're drawing upon, which everyone should read, is the one right here. It's called uh, JFK and the Unspeakable by uh, James uh, Douglas. You know, he's he's done the most exhaustive picture ever, and this door's book was endorsed by Oliver Stone, among others. Um, James Douglas was a devout Catholic and pacifist. Um, who I think is still alive down in Alabama, but he 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 he, he goes through and, and you'll notice the same kind of image here as in that portrait I showed you of, of Kennedy looking down in kind of a reflective mode. This is a man who changed, right? Changed by circumstances where um which I'll talk about. The fact is in the 1960 elections between um, Kennedy and Richard Nixon, right, Kennedy, you know, in one aspect of him, you know, came who spoke as a cold warrior. He talked about something called the missile gap, that somehow during the um, Eisenhower period, that somehow the, the, the Soviets had been able to get ahead in terms of their deployment of, of, of certain kind of uh, nuclear weapons. And of course, that wasn't the entirety of, of John Kennedy's message, but it was out there. This was a, uh, a campaign that was run in the height of what was called the Cold War. And once again, I would recommend you guys go back to my earlier class about the genesis of NATO, the role of Winston Churchill, you know, driving a, a, a wedge between the US and our ally against Adolf Hitler, Russia you know, and, and bringing NATO into existence, basically to perpetuate, a, you know, Anglo-American empire as, as, as dominating the world, you know, um, in the post-war period. Minutes, please. But as you know, if you were there um, alive, and I certainly was, I was in second grade uh, at the time, and I grew up right outside Washington, D.C. in Maryland, right? U.S. blockades, Cuba tells Russ lay off, right? You had this, um, situation develop around Cuba, where uh, reconnaissance photos sh um, showed, um, you know, uh, emplacement of offensive weapons in Cuba. Of course, the U.S. had placed weapons in Turkey. Um, what are we going to do about it? And there were elements of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and it's documented in this book, uh, Curtis LeMay, among others, that's saying, go hit them, go hit them, <clears throat> you know, hit them now, you know, they won't respond. And um, and, 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 and Kennedy had to think about the consequences if he listened to his national security team in terms of the million, and he says this to Bobby, the millions of innocent children that would die, you know, this would be extermination. He had to figure something out. And he set up a, uh, through very, and then there's a book and a movie, which I also recommend called 13 Days with Kevin Costner uh, about, the patient secret diplomacy that brought the um, Cuban Missile Crisis to an end, um, but it was secret. You know the 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 the, the, the quid it from from the public eye it looked like Khrushchev had backed down, but there was a secret protocol to to begin to move missiles out of Turkey. Okay. Uh, um, oh, uh, but before, the uh, if you see oh. the movie at the end, the Joint Chiefs guys say, "Yeah, well, we made them back down on this one. Now we can hit them in." Southeast Asia and the Middle East, you know, so. Okay. Um, can you um, wrap up in about five minutes? So anyway, so, so anyway, Kennedy began to very profoundly think about this question of, of peace. And it was a zigzag course because you had a situation developing around Vietnam. But um, this is a picture of a speech that he made at American University uh, in August of 1963 to the incoming right, so class wrap up uh, in of American University, which is a, is a training college for diplomats, saying, you know, not just peace in our time, but peace for all time. Basically identifying an end to the Cold War, you know, cooperation on the higher mission of mankind. 
you know, in October, he addressed the United Nations, even, um, you know, uh, advocating a joint effort to, on the moon, right? That, it, that the moon and space was big enough for both of us to work together. Well, we know what happened one month later in Dallas. And, uh, um, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm down here in Houston. Um, uh, uh, Houston, um, I, I believe uh, Kennedy spoke at Rice, uh, Rice Hotel that day. Um, you know, we, we, we saw, but then he went to Dallas and, and it was, and Douglas develops exhaustively what the nature of the setup was, the Secret Service standing down and everything else. And then two days later, um, Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald. The Warren Commission came together uh, with Warren Dulles, the former head of the CIA, prominently on the board. Uh, lone assassin, case closed, let's move on, okay? And uh, I, I am in Texas. My, I, my friend Diane, Ron's wife, mentions that she was in, in junior high or middle school, you know, when this happened. You know, and when the word came in of Kennedy's assassination, there were cheers. There were cheers because Kennedy was being portrayed as a pro commie, pinko, you know, sympathot, commie simp, and, and so forth, right? So, um, but anyway, so, so this, this, so obviously, I, I mean, I talk about the Kennedy assassination of people when I'm out in the field and no one believes the lone assassin. So we you know, lie and, and we've been living with that lie. But those of us that lived through the 60s into the 70s, there was a whole train of other assassinations, you know, and these are, um, you know, what tied them together? Uh, Malcolm X, right? Martin Luther King, whom of course we're commemorating his birthday next week, you know, um, um, Bobby Kennedy, and I had never really heard of Fred Hampton before um, until recently. Um, he was killed, I believe, in, in 71 in Chicago, right? But, you know, all of these uh, individuals, and I've read the autobiography of Malcolm X. I've read uh, a lot from King. You know, King uh, was breaking out of simply being a civil rights leader. You know, he, um, he was very much involved in a fight for economic justice. You know, he was in on the founding of the... Uh, uh, nation of Ghana, and he gave a, a, a speech at Riverside Church um, one uh, year before his assassination, breaking with Lyndon Johnson on the Vietnam War. Obviously, oh. Bobby Kennedy, who would probably have won the presidency that year, would take on this wretched establishment in the intelligence services. Malcolm X, if you've read his writings, you know, after he went to Mecca, he himself enlarged his view of, of what the, the interests of humankind were not, you know, beyond just questions of race. And I think there was a similar transformation going on with Fred Hampton from the little I've read about him. But you can enlarge that, you know, because you see, you know, NATO's policy, you know, as the enforcer of a Latter-day uh, um, British empire is to, you know, is to keep, you know, the world subdued under control of private finance, you know, unable to advance and develop. And there were a whole series of assassinations. Uh, on the left, this is a lady that uh, Linda de Helga LaRouche met with three times, you know, Indira Gandhi, who was a modernizer for India. Um, Muammar Gaddafi, do people know that the um, invasion, you know, and the destruction of Libya was a NATO war? Did you know that? There were 26,500 um, NATO sorties uh, went into bombing uh, Libya back to the Stone Age. People that are, are, are crying the blues about, you know, uh, Russia bombing infrastructure, you know, in, um, you know, in uh, Ukraine today, you know, they, they were cheering this idea of bombing Iraq back to the Stone Age, bombing um, Libya back to the Stone Age, okay? You know, and when, um, when Gaddafi was trying to uh, flee under a flag of truce, you know, on the Jeep, uh, Apache helicopters strafe the highway so the Jeep could not move forward. And then they let um, the assets of ISIS just finish the job and, and lynch him. You know, now the guy on the bottom was Alfred Harehausen, uh, who was also um, kind of an associate of my movement in Germany. Helga LaRouche is German. And he was the head of Deutsche Bank, uh, who was going to put forward a generous policy for development east, eastward for uh, Germany. Um, uh, after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, well, 
he was shot dead in a very sophisticated car bombing, which was, oh, it's, oh, it's the Red Brigade. Now, no one had heard of the Red Brigade for, you know, at least 15 years. Suddenly, the Red Brigade surfaced, blew up his car, killed him, you know, and Helmut Kohl, under duress, bit the bullet and, and uh, signed on to the dotted line to subordinate Germany to the euro. So the development and cooperation approach died with the murder of Herrhausen. So um, then there were some assassinations that didn't quite happen, right? You know, wrap it um, up, Joe. Charles de Gaulle, oh. right, who insists on a certain sovereignty for uh, France. There's a movie called Day of the Jackal. You can watch on this. Um, de Gaulle is the one that let Algeria go from colonial status. He, he pulled out of NATO in 1966, you know, in terms of, of you know, con, to, to develop an independent um, uh, capability for um, for France, independent of NATO. You know, there was uh, oh, can you hear Pope me John Paul quick, II, please? right? Joe, who, Joe, you know, Joe, having Joe, lived with the on. communists and, 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 and the Nazis, you know, in growing up in Poland, nonetheless was a very, very critical period for the peaceful transition that we saw um, with, um, you know, with the Berlin Wall and all that coming down during his tenure right, as Pope. Thank you, Joe. And then, of course, there was Ronald Reagan. Okay, What did Joe. we hear about that one? Joe, oh, oh, I, oh, we gotta go. Oh, a lone assassin up, would be Joe. assassin. Um, um, Hinckley, right, had oh, an obsession with up. Jodie Foster, the movie star, and that's why he wanted to kill Reagan, right? Yeah, how many people here know that Hinckley's father was having lunch with Neil Bush, you know, up in Aspen, Colorado, the day of the assassination? You know, who would have become president if, if that bullet had hit Reagan's heart? You know, well, Bush, the CIA. Okay. And of course, while we're talking about Bush, there was another assassination that didn't quite happen. And that was the assassination of Lyndon LaRouche. And I witnessed that my, this myself. I was in Leesburg, Virginia at the time as um, a manager of all of our publications in terms of the, the mailing that went out. You know, and I saw uh, on um, October 6, 1986, um, the, no. the armored personnel carriers, the, no. the sledgehammers, and the helicopters come into no. Leesburg. Wrap it up. You know, and it came out in, in various testimony yeah, that the intention so. was to try to uh, provoke the shootout at LaRouche's so. um, you know, residence. But that didn't happen because we were able to get a message through to Reagan, who was not running this thing. It was, it was Bush, right? So this assassination capability has got to be taken down. You can't have, you know, an elected government acting like a bunch of quivering cowards, you know, going along with a um, goose stepping toward a policy that could only take us to nuclear war. Okay. You know, I reference here um, uh, uh, Chuck Schumer there with Rachel Maddow, you know, at the time that, um, you know, the, uh, the whole big fairy tale about Vladimir Putin right. hacking the Democrats began to come out and Put, and Trump put some pushback and Schumer says, oh, you can't tangle with the intelligence services. They, they have six, six ways from Sunday of getting back to you. So go along with the FBI. And this just, you know, and this is one of the reasons I quit the Democratic Party. You know, I'm not, I'm not a Republican either. I told you I Joe, your time is a, up. But the party of peace and progress. Your time under, is um, up. Kennedy has become the party of war and the FBI. And we have to get it sold back by bringing the truth out about, um, um, you know, the Kennedy murder. Yeah. Now, um, you know, and of course, this has a future orient. Thank you. All right, let's go to questions. Joe, we had to mute. Uh, Joe, what happened, uh, mute, uh, Joe, we I'm almost done. Uh, um, well, the time's up, Joe, because it's about 11. That it's, we understood. Lindsey but Graham is now blabbing Joe. about how it's Joe. time to... Uh, <laughs> Assassinate Vladimir. So, so, the, the, the war is not the, the slam dunk that NATO thought it would be. Okay, so, right. um, thank is you. There a problem? Yay. Yay. You're, you're now muted, Joe. We had to get to rebuttals. Let's All right, on. let's go to let's go to questions. Uh, no, we're going to we're straight to questions, questions, Charlie. We're going on to rebuttals. Yeah. Okay. But, no questions. No questions. Who decided, decided, decided that? I go. What, what, did I you say? I go to. I, 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 I'm and the go, anniversary of the gallows and changing the format. No, we're just because of the time and required with the speeches. There's people who want to speak. Well, find out who wants to speak. No, no, you've got to have. You've got to follow the format. 
Okay. You can just uh, yeah, come over well, here. Okay. Um, oh, no, you guys, you, you follow the format. Okay, we're going to have an event on the 14th, okay, um, which I want you, it's posted on the um, site uh, about complete Dr. King's mission, shut down the Assassination Bureau, okay, uh, and release the JFK no, files. No, it's not okay. Wrap it up. What All want right. To okay, okay, guys, you know. Thank um, you very much. Thank you. The format is that I get to speak, and the other two speakers took considerably yeah, longer than they were up. promised as well. Your, your time. Okay. Is, no, you are the longest one, Joe. I timed you quite a while. Okay. Yeah, All right. right. Let's go for a few questions. We'd like to hear you, but it's yeah. just you know we were trying for the last ten or fifteen minutes to get you to kind of wrap it up a little bit, and I understand how it goes. All right. Now, if there's anybody got any questions or not. Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, I have one I have a question right. for Joe. Go ahead. Can, 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 can you, can Joe, can you hear me? Get it, get the I mic. do. Is that Tom? Yeah. Or... One question I have regarding Ukraine. You talked about the Minsk Accord. You talked about the Minsk Accord and some other sure. things. Sure. But what about the Budapest Memorandum way back in 1994? How, how do you do that? And uh, how does that work into your thinking on Ukraine versus Russia? And, <coughs> Well, who is, who's talking, by the way? Ernie, that was Ernie Norman. Norman. Okay, I think you asked me about this once before. I might have. Um, but I but I can't claim to be an expert on the Budapest Accords. Okay. Well, can you explain that to me? Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, in 1994, the, the uh, Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, and in 1994, uh, with the uh, blessing or encouragement of the U.S. and I believe Great Britain, uh, Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons. They and Kazakhstan, along with Russia, sure, had some of the Soviet Union's nuclear weapons. Right. And uh, the the powers that be decided let's let's concentrate these in Russia. Okay. And uh, uh, so they had what they call the Budapest Memor Memorandum. In right. which Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons, right? Guaranteed protection by uh, the U.S. and I believe Great Britain and Russia against any uh, attacks from the outside. Right. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got a picture of so it here. It says obviously you know, nobody. Nobody in Washington is talking about this because. It's very embarrassing to the U.S. that uh, okay, uh, and, you know, wrap wrap it up. Yeah, rebuttals, rebuttals. Let's well, I answer the question, Joe. Can how do you feel? How do you feel about that? Isn't that an issue? Well, once again, in 1991, in 1991, you know that was at the point that the Soviet Union peacefully split apart into the constituent republics. There were two referendum where um, Ukraine, the people of Ukraine, voted for neutrality. They wanted to be at peace with their neighbors, okay, east and west. And um, I guess the Budapest Accords were um, negotiated three years later. This is when Boris Yeltsin was um, running things in Russia. Now, there was also something that happened, I don't remember the exact date, called the so-called Orange Revolution, um, where Poroshenko, no, not Poroshenko, Timoshenko, I, I get the, yeah, I think Poroshenko came in and then he was voted out, you know, um, but once again, um, the, the international observer said there's vote fraud, there's vote fraud, so they overturned an election and brought in Poroshenko and immediately, what you had was Western finance coming in, the IMF and Western corporations pushing their same snake oil of privatization and so forth. And that's what was um, the population threw out. But that's that's my answer to that. They didn't want to have the nuclear weapons. Okay. All right. I have a question for Joe. Uh, all right, Calvin, we got four people in front of you and I don't think we're going to be able to have time to do rebuttals because of Charlie's meddling with the question. So Margaret, you're next. Then Charlie, then... Um, Alex and Luna, and then you, Kelvin. So go ahead and ask questions. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to know where, where you got your information about Medicare uh, being cut and what do you mean it was being cut? And there was a um, there was a end of the year appropriations thing to get through the year, and there was a there, I, I got it. Uh, I'll look it up and send it to you. But this I read a briefing, an intelligence briefing every morning as to what happens, and that was in the end of the year continuing resolution to, to take. Where do you get your intelligence briefing from? Well, I'm part of an international intelligence news service, and we read newspapers from all around the world. We call people. We put together. I read okay. about 20. In, but if uh, if you want, Margaret, you can give me an email, and I'll uh, send it to you if you want. Uh, that's the, um, I'll, I'll look up my own, because I couldn't find anything. But then uh, it, it, I just did a real brief Zoom. Anyway, go ahead. All right, Charlie, you're next. Yeah, I'd like to ask John. Does he feel the passage of the Workers' Rights Amendment is going to facilitate the formation of unions across the state of Illinois? I'll get you on camera. I'll get you on camera. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I do. And actually, I saw your prediction there, Charlie, about 100% organization of workers in Illinois which I don't know if it'll get to there, but I, I think that there's going to be a lot more uh, workers joining unions all across the state, uh, beginning with these uh, Starbucks workers and right. other workers who are, you know, working in, uh, uh, you know, the service sector and maybe even the Amazon workers, you know. Uh, so I think it's, uh, and, and actually, you know, when you talk about the fight for democracy in, in the United States, a mass trade union movement and a mass, uh, a huge increase in the number of, of working people in trade unions, I think is, is really a fundamental part of that. Okay. Um, now, uh, I, I think that's Galaxy 13. Is that you, Jan? Yes. Okay. Go ahead and ask your question. Okay, my question is for Ernie. Um, I couldn't hear him. So he was supposedly talking about uh, how to end gun violence and I never got the point. Could he say in a few sentences what the point was? Well, the, yeah, the point is that they're all different kinds of gun violence and the solution there's not one across the board, one size fits all solution. Now, anti-gun people think there is. They say, well, we just get rid of guns and then yeah. we're gun violence, okay? Now that is very probably not gonna happen, but we can reduce gun violence in each of the categories by going after them with stricter gun laws and even like with very much and very much stricter gun laws, national gun laws, national gun registry. But I also support gun rights for responsible citizens. So uh, uh, there's no, and there's so no there's the problem. But <laughs> it doesn't it's not guns. doing anything. I'm sorry? Not doing anything. All right, just-, just Well, I, I can't hear what you're saying, Charlie. You're, you're really not right. doing anything. I'm not saying anything? You're not doing anything. Who's not doing anything? Uh, you. It's I'm not up to one person, Charles. It's up the, to the, all the of us. So he's got to present the policy. Of Charlie, one fool at a time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, David. Uh, I'm I'm advocating raising the 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 uh, age for buying that and possibly for all weapons. That's the only thing you said. All right. And having a very strict national gun registry. Okay. Now mm -hmm. there are 200 million guns out there now. That's a problem. Uh, how are we gonna how are we gonna get those guys properly into the registry? Uh, with, you know, to restrict penalties. I mean, we don't punish murderers in this country. So it's tough to see how we're gonna get people who who uh, own guns they're not supposed to have, how we're gonna motivate them to register their guns. But uh, at least the theory is there. Uh, this merits more discussion. I think there are more questions, so I'm gonna pass right. the mic back uh, to Tim. All right, this will be our last question. Kelvin, you've got, you've got the floor. Yeah, it's to Joe. Um, I understand that you're 
um, your views on, on Ukraine and Russia are not mainstream, and a lot of your friends are receiving pressure and being uh, your, your movements are being ostracized. Um, how many of them have been defenestrated? And since you have a, a, a very particular interest in political assassination, what do you think of the preponderance of Putin's critics to fall out hotel windows? I, I know what the word defenestration means. That's what triggered the Thirty Years' War there in Prague. But, yeah, uh, what's the thing about the, the, the performance of uh, Putin's critics? I don't know. I've never heard this. All out of the hotel windows. It, it seems to be a very, very high percentage for some reason. I wonder if you had any thoughts on that. No, no thoughts. Uh, I thought not. All right. <laughs> at this at this point, now we we're, we 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 allowed a certain amount of time for questions. Did you ask, did you ask anybody got any else? Anybody else got a question? All right, Charlie, we, we closed the question period officially. We know you're at home. Uh, we're going to let David now. I'm going to hand him my over to David. We're going to check, check and see who's got rebuttals. You don't change the format, pal. You haven't changed the format, you idiot. Yeah, you just said there's no questions. <laughs> well, are there That's questions? Not, Shut you, up. You the world. Where did you show up and change the format? After 75 years. We haven't changed the format, Charlie. We're just cutting up questions. The people. All out time for the models. You don't declare. You don't take a take over at goddamn college. Go ahead, David. All right. If I said a rebuttal to everything that Joe said, we'd be here all night. So I'm not going to bother with that. Instead, I'm simply going to say the following. A, 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 a prediction for my own here. And that is that the new Speaker of the House, McCarthy, is going to have to cut deals with the Democrats if he wants to get anything done. Oh. Otherwise, he's going to have a very, he's going to discover that the speakership is no bed of roses. Finally, with what John, with what John said earlier with regard to Democratic victories, people though haven't been paying attention to what's been going on in Michigan, where the congressman, I forget his first name, oh, just left off, and his last name is Meyer. Yeah, he's the scion of, of the Meyer grocery store fortune. He has pointed out that the Republican Party in Michigan is in complete disarray. That all the statewide constitutional officers in Michigan are Democrats, that the Democrats for the first time in 40 years won a majority in both houses of the Michigan legislature. And both of Michigan senators are now Democrats, though one Senator Stabenow has been on, she's not going to run again in 24. So it's like in Illinois, the Democrats have locked up state government there. Bravo. All right. To ask for somebody if you got them online. Ask yeah. for online rebuttals now. Online rebuttals. Who wants to go? Can give me a chance on my Okay. Uh, anybody doing a rebuttal on? Ask for her. Anybody doing a rebuttal online? Okay, Margaret, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I am, of course, going to rebut without hearing like 90, 80% of what was going on. My only. Uh, knee-jerk reaction to LaRouche people is that um, one time we had a woman come and she gave us a whole list of quotations that were totally taken out of context and ultimately the whole thing didn't mean anything. So that was my first thing. And the second thing is that I, I know you have no idea even who I'm talking about, so there you go, but you know, you burned your bridges already. Um, and then the second thing is, is just with that little uh, thing about well, uh, the other speakers talked longer than I did. They took much more time than I did. And you were directly contra contra indicated by, or contradicted by somebody who was actually keeping time and said that the other speakers did not take more time than you did. You took more time than they did. So I'm just looking at that and thinking, nah. But that's, that's it. That's my only thing. Thank you. All right, Doug, uh, you're next. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, hi. Um, Introduce yourself, too. I'm Ellen Corley. Uh, good to be here. Um, I, my main rebuttal is that uh, I would like to be on the topic. We need to have more actual free speech in terms of, um, I know Charlie had blocked me earlier in the year from being able to mention vaccine or any of the research. Here we go again. Uh, that has to be done. The same story for three years. Anyhow, that and um, also uh, 
you know, Ukraine. We have to have a, really the fairness doctrine of free, uh, you know, discussion of points of view. That's what free speech is. Also, um, I, I particularly appreciated um, uh, Joe's talks and Lyndon LaRouche's, actually a topic that Charlie would approve. He wouldn't let me talk about John Birch, even though I- I'm It's a personal sure. attack, that's not- um, he said We down. already talked about it. No, I think we've already talked about Ukraine too, didn't we? Or um, other, I don't know what other topics are, but I, I did appreciate your talk there. And um, gun violence is actually something I've studied. Uh, I got involved with politics with Obama's Organizing for Action Fellows Program where we were looking at gun violence and what were the causes of it. And, um, you know, this is uh, now in the visible. And uh, it's, and the only problem with that is it really what I discovered looking for coalitions around the issue is we've got to stop police crime. We have to look at the guns, the drugs, the deep state was brought in by the CIA, the FBI, the Justice Department in the National Endowment for Democracy. That's why Lyndon LaRouche's uh, and the Schiller groups and Joe Jennings and, and Ron's um, point of view is so critically important and is being censored out of the mainstream news. If, if we don't have, we have to restore the fairness doctrine, the, the Federal Communication Commission, expand it, include cable and publishing and uh, educational media and, because right now we have basically got a one-sided, you know, version of, of truth and history, and uh, it's being written by straight out of uh, the octopus, you know, the mafia national security state, you know, um, that controls all of us. This, this is really the fourth right. That's the book that I wanted to bring. There's been a COVID coup, a fourth right. Uh, the, the virus is a biological warfare. And after three years, the public has no idea about, while they're dropping dead of sudden death. And all you hear from the radio is that people go, well, we don't know. The doctors don't know why this guy died. Well, we know why. Mark Crispin Miller has been documenting sudden deaths. It's about the nanoparticles and the 5G. You put the two together. We gave a talk on that here. That's what causes that. Plus the spike protein clinging to the to the cells that causes cancer, and we know that. But why doesn't the media know it? And, well, because Thomson Reuters and AP and all of them are they were captured. We are a controlled. It's a game theory. It all goes back to the stolen prosecutor management information system, 1981. Rafi Eitan, the Mossad, the coup Israeli, worked with the Reagan administration to to basically control the internet and all the information and all the Justice Department records so that you have a, our, they, the F, FOP here in Chicago says, we get to destroy all the records every five years, put that in the contract, hire a thousand extra cops and destroy all the records about police crime. They, you know, why don't you look at the police crime? You know, they're, they're frame-ups just like Lee Harvey Oswald and, and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, you know, that's all we have. Is, are you saying time's up? No, 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 Go, about two minutes. Two minutes more, okay. You know, we it's all about false flag, false flag, you know, read Kevin Barrett's false flag news. You know, if 9-11 was a false flag, an inside job, the prosecutor management system was given by us to Al-Qaeda, to Osama bin Laden, to make it look like he did it. They're all set up. The Gulf of War, you know, the Gulf of uh, whatever it was, the Gulf of Tykin or whatever, Duncan, you know, was set up to get us into the Vietnam War. You know, the Pearl Harbor was set up to get us up into World War II. The, uh, the killing of the Archduke got us into World War I. You know, America, Washington said, you know, watch out for parties, politics, divide and conquer. And don't and watch out for foreign entanglements. Why don't we listen? Oh, well, yeah, it's not in the Constitution. Our problem is we've got the Federalist Society <laughs> who are basically controlled over by Carl Schmidt, whose model is Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, the Leviathan. We're basically, this is feudalism that pretending to be what they've got is power politics. You've got a, the Supreme Court and the power, you know, the parliament or the 
and the president, you know, all three, oh, that's going to really come to a bright sense of democracy. No, it, it, it just a perfect formula for tyranny, we you know, like right? Oh, yeah. We, hey, really, it's all based in how no stupid are we? You know? What? Money. It's all about the money. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Thank okay. you. <laughs> all right. We got a new fan over there. Yeah. Tim, I, Tim, could you put me in the list also? I can't uh, get no, Yeah, we, we will, Ron. All okay. right, Charlie, you're next. Go okay. ahead, Charlie. Unmute. Unmute, Charlie, you're next for rebuttal. Uh, no, uh, let's let, let, let Ron go. Let Ron no, go. go ahead, Charles. Oh, All no, right. you go ahead. No, no, no Charles. All right. All right. I'll pray move. Go ahead, Charles, All right, go I'll go ahead. ahead. First all right. of all, I'd like to thank our three speakers for nice presentations and uh, to set off the, the coming year. Uh, my prediction is, is that organized labor is going to overtake the state of Illinois. Uh, but anyhow, I've got three things. One, regarding the election, uh, the Republicans, unfortunately, have control of the House, which means they are the chairs and the majority members of each of the committees. This is a, a, a nefarious situation. Uh, what is the positive aspect of it is, is that the Republicans are incredibly ineffective at passing any kind of legislation. Um, during the Trump administration, they were able only to get through a tax cut was the only measure during the four year, entire four year period. They tried a multitude of things certainly destructive in many respects, but in terms of legislatively, uh, this was totally ineffectual. And your evidence here is in even choosing their own leadership. Uh, I don't perceive them. Uh, I predict that they will not be effective in any fashion towards implementing real change. Now too, regarding this gun thing, I'm sorry, Ernie, you offer no solution whatsoever. I'm going to offer one. If you want to own a gun, you have to have insurance to the tune of at least $100,000 a liability policy. Yeah, you can own a gun. Uh, but the only thing he actually said was that you're going to raise the, the age to 25. Well, this is your notion of, of solution to gun control. The motivation, examining motivation, since you can't change the motivation of people to shoot one another, why bother looking at it in the first place? If you're not going to eliminate motivation, you have to eliminate not the, the, the you have to eliminate the means, the means of people shooting one another, not the motive. We can't change motives of the entire population of the nation. We can, however, change the means, M-E-A-N-S, the method that they use for inflicting violence. And the other thing is, you gotta avoid internal contradictions. You say that guns enable crime, and then guns deter crime. Charlie, we gotta go on. Hey, I got, wait a minute, okay, I'm not finished. And last of all, the uh, yeah, he's so worried about charging his being This girl, that was the previous speaker, made a personal attack against me, and you're sitting there, and you didn't say anything. Yeah, you allowed it. Anyhow, third thing, Joe, thanks. The link for Joe's things are on the website in four places. But however, he doesn't understand the men's accords were, of my understanding, anybody who looked this up was to deter this Russia from the army from involvement in causing a, a revolt in the Ukraine. And I don't know why he's talking. I mean, the, the idea was to get Russia out of the Ukraine from their incursions before. That's all, but anyhow, I wanna thank the three speakers. Thank you very much. I turn it over to Ron and others. All right, Ernie and then Ron. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to be, to, to be on that some points. All right, Kelvin, we'll let you go next. 
Hold on. I'll, okay. Well, well yeah. let's go ahead, Ernie. Should I go. Yeah. And then Kelvin. Uh, I, I was okay. going to give a short rebuttal to Joe, but actually now I have to give a short rebuttal to Charlie for rebutting me. Uh, first of all, I think your idea of insurance is a good one. I hadn't thought about that. That is that is a very good idea. But if you mean by taking the means from people who violence with guns, eliminating guns, you're you're harming. There are 200 million guns in the, in the country. There are millions of responsible gun owners in the country, and you're going to penalize these people uh, unnecessarily. Uh, for, yeah, uh, yeah, I am. Well, fine. Uh, no, un unnecessarily. This is. I don't want to get into this too much more now because it's a it's a topic which we can talk about for hours. And uh, uh, you know, as far as stopping people. <laughs> Taking the motive away, there are a lot of ways we can take the motive away. One of them is economic. If people are doing well, they're less like, likely to go out and commit a gun crime. Okay. And there are other mental mental health issues. You're going to eliminate bullying in school. That would save okay. these cases. Now, I'm going to get on my main rebuttal, which is speaking uh, to Joe. Uh, Joe, I have a soft spot in my heart for anyone who's willing to get up and speak intelligently and, and sincerely. Uh, from a point of view that is very, very unpopular. Your point of view is very, very unpopular and you're still willing to get out there and talk about it. Uh, I appreciate that and I admire that. However, I agree with you. I disagree with you greatly uh, on uh, what I perceive to be your conclusion. As an American, I have to say I'm a little bit ashamed of how little we are doing for Ukraine because uh, here we have a country it's not the first time we've done this where we've gone in and then tried to help people and then deserted. But uh, if, if, we, if Russia is successful in encroaching on Ukraine, uh, that's just the beginning. Uh, will they stop at the NATO borders? Maybe. I think we've given some, some heavy indication that we won't necessarily go by it, but we would call it Article 5, where if the NATO country is attacked, we will, we will defend. Uh, I, uh, considering what we're seeing, I, I, I have a difficult time believing that we would really put some efforts in if, uh, uh, if uh, Russia attacked, um, uh, and then you. Uh, let's say, Estonia or something like that, or Lithuania or whatever. Uh, I would hope that we would, but I think uh, NATO or no NATO, we should be defending people that are, are being uh, addressed upon. And, and, and that hear is what is happening, and not just by throwing money at it. This is a good old mic. American solution: is to throw money. Give me, give me your mic. You're, you're not coming through. Give me, give me your mic. Oh. I think I got to turn it on real quick. Okay. I'm sorry about that. My Did apologies. anybody hear? I think. Hello, testing. All it's right. coming through. He's just not speaking oh. into it. All right. Talk louder. We hear perfectly. No problem. Yeah. No problem. yeah just right. come right. on. I hope you can nothing to say anyway. All hear me. So, so that's my feeling. We should be doing more than we're doing now. No uh, personal attack. Uh, Russia, uh, Russia they're, everybody's scared about World War III, meaning uh, a nuclear conflagration. I don't think, you know, I think we may be in World War III already. It's just not nuclear and it's not worldwide. Uh, I do not believe that that's Russia just. will risk using nuclear weapons. They have too much to lose. Uh, it has to be considered, but this is how how criminals uh, of all types uh, intimidate people with possibilities of, of great violence. And the fact is, unfortunately, if they point a gun at somebody, said there's a, as big a gun pointing at their head. So I don't view that uh, as a problem. Okay. And I, I have a few other ideas I wanted to pass on, but I'm I'm. You know, senior moment, I'm forgetting them. So, is there who else wants to? Uh, give me, give me here. Okay. Okay, Kelvin, can you hear me? You're next. Yeah. Okay. Um, when I first come on this, uh, looked at this for, for tonight, he said it was going to be kind of a, a review of the year and um, well, maybe some predictions. Uh, I don't, I can't really think of anything more typifies the review of the year in uh, American politics. And then this post, uh, I, well, this, this letter I, I come across in November. And it's, uh, it goes like this. Uh, Dear Dr. Kelvin, I am thinking about leaving what has come to view as a toxic, abusive relationship. 
I first came across Donald in 2015. I had self-esteem issues at the time, which were exacerbated by him telling me I really was in bad shape. I believed him when he said not only could he make things better, but make things great. To be honest, at the first, you know, when he first became part of my life, things did look great for, for a while. Uh, finances seemed to be on the up. I've since discovered that he was maxing out our credits and giving money to his friends. But all the time he was telling me what a great job he was doing and how much the people at work loved him. Then his job gave him a formal warning, something to do with an inappropriate phone call that he maintained was perfect. It, it did lead to being slightly demoted in 2018, but Donald told me that it was just some troublemakers at work because he was so tremendously good at his job, it was bound to cause some jealousy. I believed him, even though I caught him lying on many occasions. He was my man and I was going to stand by him. Then COVID came. At first, Donald told me it was nothing to be afraid of and it would all be over by Easter. He would keep us safe. Then he got COVID himself. Not only that, but I think he gave it to one or two of our friends as well. And to top it off, it could not have come at a worse time as he was up for a re-interview for his job. You have to reply for every four years, but normally this is just a formality. Well, he didn't get taken on again. And I was told to work it out his three month notice. Donald was furious. He ranted on about how, tra how the traitors and how they'd rigged the whole brace process to rob him of his job that he was so tremendously good at. It was after that he started asking me for money. It was to fight his case in court, but the court cases seemed to be going nowhere. And none of the judges, some of the judges just laughed at his nonsensical legal arguments he brought forth. I don't know what he did with all the money I gave him, but it couldn't have been on good quality lawyers. In the meantime, he didn't go to work much, just played golf and moped around the house, plotting with his cronies on how he was going to get his job back. It finally came to a head a few days before he had to leave his job, and he actually persuaded some of his friends to break into his boss's place of work and threaten them with violence if he didn't keep them off. The authorities were called and his friends were all, all charged and convicted, but as of now, he has not been, although I suspect it'll only be a matter of time. We have since moved to Florida, and all our time and money seems to be taken up with legal matters. If it's not one case, it's another. So many are losing count. Not only that, but it cost a lot of our friends jobs at the same place by insisting he tell everyone he was fired improperly. He has, of course, reapplied for his old job, but quite honestly, I cannot see him getting it back. And then, just the other week, I caught him having dinner with some very shady characters, and I'm worried he might do something stupid again. What should I do, Kel Dr. Kelvin? I trusted along this man for six years, and now I find he's just been using me. Now I look stupid. Maybe I should listen to him when his ex-friends, including his own sister, told me how wrong the guy was. But I was in love, and I kept on telling me how great everything was going to be. I feel like such a fool, but can I really abandon him when he needs me most? What happens if he goes to jail? He will love no one. Yours truly, the elephant in the room. All right, Andy, you're next. Okay, Andy, you're next. Yeah, go right ahead. My name is Andy Anderson. Louder, louder. I, I can't hear him. Hello? Okay, can you hear him? Can you hear that now? Louder, Andy. I'm, I'm yelling into it. It's half bad connection. Um, hang on. Try it now. Hello? He needs a new mic. Um, let me try, let me try it. Okay, uh oh, I haven't quite finished. She replied and as I asked, I told her to get a documents in order and see a lawyer. But unfortunately, all the lawyers that she knows have been disbarred and are looking for their own attorneys. Can you guys and as far as the documents, about? somebody's taken away the documents. And I think she, that Donald wanted to get into some real kind of kinky S&M stuff. Because she said, hey, if you want to get your hey, documents, can we hear Andy? Can we hear Andy? Let's get Andy. Okay, Andy, if you're next, let's go. It's okay. working, so just yell into it. Okay. Yell into it. We've got to get some batteries for that thing. Just go, no, no, yeah, just, just go ahead, Andy. Just go ahead. Yeah. 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 Hello, um, I'm Andy Anderson. Um, I'd like to make a few comments. Um, Louder, Andy. I collect books on blacked out subjects. The latest one uh, just hit the a bookstore is uh, Project Center, uh, Sonoma State. This one says the state of the free press. If you want to know how the press is managing things, uh, <laughs> book is loaded 
for the top 25 censored suppressed stories of the year. Another book, for those of you that wonder what the Republican Party is up to, this book describes it. It's called The Cruelty Is the Point. Adam Serber Serler is the, uh, is the author. And it just goes into great detail about the difference between current Republicans and current Democrats. Lastly, if you want to know what's happening, why we have out uh, such uh, how to put it, uh, this country tolerates mass killings. There, this book describes uh, what happened with 3,000 people were murdered on September 11th. It's called Where Did the Towers Go? Now, the lawsuits like asbestos and tobacco, lawsuits are getting near, uh, heading toward uh, full recognition in the courts. Uh, over reopen the case and go after the people that murdered 3,000 people. In a nutshell, it wasn't done by Al Qaeda, it was done by people in the American administration of Bush and Cain. So, if 100, the current numbers, up to date uh, stuff that's been on the news, internet news sites, you can look it up, it's documented. Hundreds, roughly 170 of the Republicans that are in the House were climate deniers and are still uh, and the election deniers. And they were involved in helping the mob uh, encourage the overthrow of the government on January 6th. We got 170 insurrectionists that just got sworn in in the House of Representatives, number one. Now, I'd, I'd like to add a couple of things to what our speaker said tonight. That was really good presentation. Uh, by both, especially, what was your name again? John. John. Uh, John had a lot of high points of what I would talk about uh, the current state of the world. Well, uh, suicides, there's all kinds of studies showing suicides go up during the Republican administration. And then they go back down when Democrats are in office. That's been a pattern for almost 50 years. That since I, Eisenhower was the last decent Republican, yeah, and Nixon was also not like the current Republican. Both of those men believed in a clean environment, clean water, a good highway system. The new current uh, group wants to privatize everything. They uh, they want to get rid of the FDA. No regulation of food, water, no regulation of chemicals. They want to go back to the 1900s robber barons. That's who just took over by a slim margin in the House of Representatives. Uh, <coughs> let's, let's gun move. violence, a uh, couple more points. We've talked about gun violence. Well, our country is number one in the world in allowing an army of homeless people to sleep in the streets and another army of people that have lost their homes and jobs. We see no hope for the future. A social safety net, in other words, not strong like it is in other countries. When, when people have no hope for the future, no hope of getting a viable job because of this factory was moved overseas, the jobs are gone, the good ones. There you have mental health problems and also violence and suicide goes up. And the lastly, we talk about, we haven't been talking about nuclear war for a long time. Missiles, firing missiles into the air, the uh, intercontinental missiles have been obsolete since 1985. Now the military is not telling people this because we would call for the shutdown of the nuclear power industry and the nuclear weapons industry if people knew that there were compact portable nuclear weapons being made that could be parked, delivered on the back of a motorcycle parked in a broom closet in a building in a city, then level the city with a phone call. 1985, there was a, a series of articles from the government and other words called the 12 bomb war. We're in the eight since 1985, compact portable weapons have been made so compact and portable that they can be delivered in a suitcase and implanted in a city. We're in the age of implants. So if you want to have to get rid of a, a decapitated country, you would do it with implanted bombs set off a cell phone call. And also, we have Google. 
uh, worldwide internet. Well, nobody's talking about the capability of those satellites. Any missile fired into the air toward the United States is like walking up to a, a, a SWAT team and pulling a gun out. It's instant suicide. The satellites will pinpoint any missile fired from any threat toward us, and we would retaliate immediately. So uh, the future is a lot brighter than what the media has been telling us, if you know where to look. Oh, one last thing. This, uh, this last week, a report came out that said it's official now. They added up everything, all the kilowatts and energy that was produced by solar and wind power in the United States. For the first year, solar and wind produced more electricity than all coal and nuclear plants combined. Okay. So we're heading toward uh, a much brighter future for clean energy. Okay. We don't have to fight over Russian oil or anything else, okay? All right. Thank you. Go ahead. All right, we got one more rebuttal. Go ahead. And then I got we got five minutes to finish off. So please um make it uh we gotta be out by in about five minutes. So all right. I just wanted to uh, well a couple observations about uh the Ukraine uh situation. I really don't think you can understand what's happening uh, in Ukraine if you don't understand the uh, over 100 years struggle by the Ukrainians for independence from Russian colonialism. And that's, uh, you know, that's just the basis, I think, of this uh, struggle that's going on there. Uh, if you don't understand that, then you obliterate the agency of the Ukrainian people. This is what they're trying, they've been trying to struggle for is, is freedom from uh, Russian domination. If you go back to 1991, there was a referendum uh, that Ukrainian people voted on, 93% declare their independence. Again, that's, uh, you, can't, you can't ignore that. Um, uh, you know, and, and this uh, goes, again, like I said, it goes back 100 years, uh, you know, through uh, not only the uh, Russian imperial period, but also through the Soviet period, now uh, through this period. Um, and you also can't understand, I think, uh, the situation if you don't understand the character of the, of the Putin regime there. To me, this is the face of fascism internationally. Um, and what he's trying to do, what they're trying to do, is trying to force Ukraine back into the post-Soviet sphere, so, so to speak, and back into the imperial kind of Russian colonial orbit. And they can't apply by the independent nature of you know, what the uh, Ukrainian people need. So I agree. I, to me, you know, the question of solidarity with Ukraine is the most important thing. They have a right to ask for, whether we like it or not, to ask for solidarity and military missions wherever they can get it. Uh, fortunately, I don't see a ceasefire taking place uh, there without their guarantee of withdrawing, you know, of their occupying forces from Ukrainian territory. Uh, and it may end up, you know, uh, resolving in a military defeat of, of Russia on Ukrainian soil. I don't, unless they're willing to abide by and withdraw, you know, from occupying sovereign countries. Anyway, that's, that's how I would hope. Okay. Let's hear Ron, Ron, Ron. All Ron, right. Ron. Go ahead, Ron. I'd like to go back to um, what an earlier speaker laid out. If you look at the year and what was accomplished in the year and what we have to accomplish in the next year, I think it, um, it sobers a little bit because all the predicates and the fact that we have a lot of confusion and uh, people with no sense of mission and purpose committing suicide, we can actually describe um, encyclopedically all the problems and a description of the problems for somebody else or ourselves, whatever. We're at a point where we have a collapsing system and the collapsing system is forcing a reality that if you look at the last year, various things were accomplished and other things were not accomplished. And on the Western side, which is the basis of all these wars, and the manipulations of geopolitics against each other to stop other dynamics have been to maintain the bailout 
of these collapsing derivatives and banking systems. And there is no solution to that except putting the bogus paper in a basically a chapter 11 bankruptcy and e reissue credit like a Lincoln did for development. On the other side, not looking at what we did not accomplish in the West, on the so-called East or the rest of the world, close, close to 6 billion of the 8 billion on the planet live in governments and institutions that are moving for a new system of development. People hear it in terms of the Belt and Road, uh, Chinese development lifting 800 million people, 800 yeah, million people out of poverty, these kinds of dynamics, and you have Africa, South America, even sections of nations of, you know, and entities in the United States and Western Europe want to get in on that. So there's a fight going on between two systems, one of which is collapsing, and the other is establishing a, a network of nation states for development. And there's an open invitation for the United States and Europe to join that. Now, that collapse and the attempt by these financial layers to maintain their collapsing system is they got to back down various nations. They got to back down Russia that's in this new alliance. They got to back down China in this new alliance. And all the Ukraines and all these things, the Afghanistans, they're all part of a longer decades operation of nation state versus, or I should say the empire against nation states forming. So we're in a situation right now where the clearest voice in all this has been for the last decades, if people want to look at this fight, the clearest voice has been Lyndon LaRouche, that we have to freeze that mountain of paper, come back to an American system of credit like Lincoln did using a Hamilton program, and we build our way out of this, exactly like Lincoln did, like uh, Roosevelt did. Okay, Ron, Ron, Hold on, I'm only... going to finish this okay. up. Right okay. now, I'm going to finish it up, but I'm okay. going to finish it up. Now the fight and people saying we got to start a war against Russia to solve this, you're going to get a thermonuclear war. There's only one way out of this is we shift the policy of the United States. And right now the United States citizen is the biggest problem because we quit thinking. Now, if we actually take a little time, go to the LaRouche, you know, the LaRouche organization or the Schiller Institute, you can actually work through the policies yourself. There's a major event tomorrow. There's one again on the 10th. So people should actually get some guts. Anybody who heard a LaRouche speaker that was a LaRouche speaker, it's fairly clear for a lot of decades that we could have built out of this. And now we have to. So I'll leave it there. Okay. All right. Real quick. I'm May I say first. something to wrap actually, up? Actually, we got to wrap it up now at the restaurant. Well, just to give me a minute, guys, there's a poem by um, Robert Burns, right, called uh, something about seeing a louse on a lady's bonnet. And he, and he concludes it, oh, would some power give us the gift to see ourselves as others see us? You've got to look outside yourself. Does anyone here contend that the U.S. was the good guys when we faked intelligence to bomb Iraq into the Stone Age, to bomb Libya? you know, to bomb Hiroshima oh, and Nagasaki. Okay, so, so because of US foreign policy since the murder of Kennedy, the world is coming to resent and hate the United States. They stick with us out of fear, not because of love, okay? Now, oh, yes. No, it's I, not okay, Joe, wrap Joe, it up. Wrap, Joe, we're done. Okay. All right. The so, we, so by backing neo-Nazis in Ukraine, we're on the wrong side of history. That has to be rectified. If we Thank you. Why we're having so much trouble in Congress with some of the legislators that are going on, look at the conduct of the college tonight. You may begin to wonder why we're having such a dysfunctional Congress. Physicians, well, they... heal thyself, and then after you heal thyself and remove the log out of your own eye, then you see clearly to get the speck out of your brother's eye. Well, if all the Democrats and all the Republicans are lined up for war, then I'll be a party of one outside of that. Thank you. Yeah. So, all right. All right. I guess I that's a wrap. Speakers, and it's time for us to say, bid you all good night. Thank you. All right, Charlie. Happy New Year. Year. All right. I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to leave the Zoom call open. Kevin, you're willing to take the uh, uh,
the controls or Charlie. All right, uh, Charlie, I'm going to transfer the Zoom call over to you. I'm going to stop recording and we're adjourned.